just like to say a few words about ISRC and uh, this. So this is the Indian scientist response to COVID-19 group. It came together on the day the Janata curfew started on March 22. Uh, a small group of us uh, wanted to respond to the crisis. Uh, we uh, rapidly grew to a large group. Now we have about 600 members from uh, pretty much all the SNT institutions in the country, several universities, uh, many faculty members, students. And it's been a group uh, which came together to one look at uh, acts as a kind of scientific interpreter for the public. Okay. We have produced many resources for the public and showing here. One is on bursting COVID-19 hoaxes. There's a lot of fake information that we've been addressing. Q&A for the public. And in the daily life series, looking at uh, hygiene uh, problems due to lockdown. Uh, we have separate resources provided for different service workers, delivery people, shopkeepers, uh, because uh, you know science communication is a great challenge of the hour. We have been looking at mental health issues that people have, several societal issues, and uh, then we have a group working on mathematical modeling and data analysis. The HISM group has been putting out uh, uh, daily updates on what's happening. And we've also been trying to explain the models for the public and uh, fair amount of analysis is there. And then uh, there's a group working on apps. There is a IT Bombay group has developed a small bag app for grocery uh, shops and so on in this context. So this is a, we've been trying to provide a range of resources for the general public and for uh, scientists and professionals as well. It's been a discussion group uh, constantly looking at uh, the situation as it evolves, providing a critique, and uh, providing a summary of our discussions and critique. So this has broadly been the range of activities. On modeling, uh, a number of people in the group have been working on models, uh, looking at parameters, emphasizing different things. Uh, we had uh, early last month a symposium on models where uh, uh, um, we had about eight presentations, me. different groups. Uh, yes, uh, yeah. Uh, it's groups, quite uh, difficult to hear. I think there might be a fan yeah. blowing across your microphone. Um, there's a strong rumbling. Is it better now? Oh, yes, thank God. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah. Oh. Okay. So, yes, so we had this discussion on models. And uh, one problem that people have been having all along is uh, access to data. Uh, whatever data in the public domain we have been discussing, but uh, the quality of data is a problem, access to data is a problem. So one of the things that came up was that we talk about models, but what we need is a symposium on data. And we have been discussing that, and this is uh, in response to that. I will now hand over to my colleague Pinaki Chaudhary, uh, the co-organizer of the symposium, to introduce the symposium and how we have planned it. Thank you. Over to Pinaki. Thank you, Jan. So welcome to everyone to on this uh, second symposium that uh, NSICOG is organizing. And uh, so today the focus is, as Jan mentioned, on data related to the COVID-19. So what kind of data is available in public domain? What can we do with that data? What are the other uh, more interesting data that would be useful to the researchers and the public at large? So these are the questions that we would like to address and the speakers uh, will be discussing many of these aspects. So we will have four presentations at the beginning and then uh, each one of uh, roughly half an hour. So we'll take a few questions, maybe one or two, uh, just some clarification questions after each speaker finishes. And then at the after the all the four presentations, we have an open discussion, and uh, there we can have more extensive discussion on the uh, uh, topics that were covered by the different speakers, as well as other questions that you may have in mind. So we have a very uh, nice panel today for our discussion. So we have Rachel Gaitunde from SCT IMST uh, Trivandrum. 
is also part of the Kerala Advisory Board, so we'll be discussing about the experience from Kerala. We have got T. Sundaraman, who was formerly with ZIPMART, NHR, NHSRC, TIS, and he'll be talking about disease surveillance programs in India. We have uh, Brahma Mukherjee from University of Michigan, and she'll be talking about predictions and role of intervention and evaluating lockdowns in the crisis of virus in India, a data science called Guams. We have Kiridhar Babu from Public Health Foundation India, and he'll be talking about data in the time of COVID-19 pandemic, what we have and what we need. So very interesting topics to discuss. So we'll get on with that. And after that, we have an open discussion, which will be initiated, initiated by uh, Girija Vaidyanathan, who was formerly Chief Secretary of Government of Tamil Nadu. So maybe we start with uh, Rafal. And uh, so I request you to uh, start sharing the screen. So let me just mention to everybody that if you have questions, just write it on the chat box and we'll follow up. Uh, I'll read out the questions and then the speakers can answer at the end of their presentation. Thank you. Rafael, you can start. Okay, um, a very good evening to everyone and probably good morning to Brahmar uh, and others who are joining uh, from the other side of the world. Um, so, um, so first of all, um, just uh, um, a, a couple of uh, points before I get into the sort of my main uh, part of the presentation. So, so what I'll be doing is basically uh, looking at uh, the challenges uh, of information uh, in an evolving epidemic. Um, and uh, I'll use my experience uh, as a member of the expert uh, committee that's advising, one of the committees that's advising the Kerala government. Uh, to sort of reflect on uh, these challenges. So it's uh, so I, I, I want to make it very clear that this is not a presentation that claims to reflect the official Kerala policy. Uh, I'm merely drawing uh, on my experience and trying to reflect uh, and uh, draw lessons uh, for wider uh, application. So having put this disclaimer, uh, you know, uh, up front, um, uh, I will be uh, trying to do four uh, things uh, in this presentation. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, I will spend a little time trying to see uh, the importance or trying to share the importance of uh, actually uh, framing uh, the very question, uh, you know, um, of uh, information, of data, and of what we are trying to do, uh, you know, when we are, quote unquote, uh, tackling or managing the epidemic. Uh, the second uh, part of my presentation will be a little bit about uh, the fact that as we have experienced the epidemic over the last uh, three months or so, uh, the information needs have been changing along the way. And, and, and I will be uh, sharing a little bit of that experience, uh, you know, as it evolved, uh, you know, uh, in Kerala specifically. Uh, and then, of course, uh, the actual response of the governments, uh, you know, in, in this uh, changing uh, uh, scenario of the epidemic. And uh, finally, wrap up with some uh, uh, reflections, uh, you know, on some of the challenges uh, that uh, you know we face. And here, I reflect uh, not as a member or, or as part of a, any particular state or committee, but uh, as a, as a public health, uh, you know, uh, uh, worker, as as a, as a you know uh, someone who's trying to reflect uh, at a larger uh, sort of uh, level the lessons uh, to be learned. So. Uh, I think the first uh, problem uh, that I have faced, and I think that many of us face, uh, is uh, the generally uh, uh, a, a very there is generally a very problematic assumption that all involved in solving a problem are asking or trying to answer the same question, um, and I think this is something uh, many of us rush into, uh, you know, uh, with this assumption. When we enter a meeting, uh, you know, especially when we are, uh, you know, uh, uh, in in a, in a sort of intersectoral uh, sort of uh, situation. So when we have politicians, uh, bureaucrats, scientists, uh, you know, frontline uh, uh, program managers uh, sitting in the room and asking, uh, "What do we do?" Uh, you know, and and each one of them is spouting an answer. Uh, I think there is an underlying assumption. Uh, that all of us are asking the same question uh, and, and trying to answer the same question. And, and uh, this, I think, to me, is uh, one of the most critical uh, aspects that we need to sort out 
before we ask the question, uh, you know, what is the uh, data? What is the, you know, what do, what is the information we need? How do we get it? What is available and so on? Um, so uh, while at one level, um, uh, we've, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm also uh, sort of raising this issue about uh, this assumption uh, since uh, we now know, and, and this comes from uh, policy studies, that how a problem is framed is extremely critical to the way uh, it is approached and, and what solutions are suggested. And, and I will pick up this thread, uh, you know, uh, later on in the presentation, uh, you know, once uh, uh, towards the end when I try and draw some uh, lessons. So that so 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 having that sort of framing of this overall problem in mind, um, what seems to us as uh, as public health uh, you know uh, uh, scientists or you know uh, uh, workers in uh, you know epidemiologists and so on, as rather non-controversial questions, uh, which is uh, you know um, uh, what, what the questions uh, one we need to answer what is the information required to answer these questions and how do you interpret the data you get uh, seem very very straightforward and you know uh, almost uh, you know uh, uh, silly to ask but i think it's uh, my experience and and i'm sure the experience of many people who have worked with policymakers who work in frontline uh, you know government uh, systems for management uh, clearly uh, show that uh, these are not uh, um, you know uh, trivial questions at all, and and I will go forward uh, just to you know uh, give you some examples and discuss this. Now, um, if you um, so so the questions that one would generally tend to ask, for example, uh, I have divided them, uh, and I and I'm approaching this as questions because I think it's it, it's helpful and useful to sort of take a problem solving approach to uh, this this whole uh, issue. Uh, and there are other ways of doing it, uh, but uh, I have divided it basically into early in the epidemic and later on in the epidemic. I, I'm not too too much a great, a great fan of the phase one, phase two, phase three, and other stages and other things like that. But in general, uh, I think uh, uh, early in the epidemic, uh, the primary question of uh, you know frontline managers, of policymakers, of bureaucrats, uh, is uh, who do I need to quarantine? Uh, and then I want to know, uh, as a policymaker, how effective uh, is my quarantining effect? Uh, and, and of course, uh, again, as frontline managers of the the whole effect, uh, you know, uh, engagement with the epidemic, I would also like to know uh, what is the nature of contact that leads to infections, because you know you're making a whole lot of uh, claims you're making a whole lot of restrictions on people's movements on you know lockdowns on physical distancing and so on uh, what do my uh, what does my experience tell me about the way the infection spreads and and i think these are three of the most important questions that you know, people at least frontline managers uh, kept asking uh, you know if not directly but indirectly these were what uh, was the most important uh, need now, later on in the epidemic, and, and, and later is a relative term, and uh, you know, it can mean uh, anywhere from uh, you know, the 10th case or the 20th case or whatever. But the point is after the initial phase of uh, you know, where the focus has been on uh, people coming in from abroad as the primary uh, sources of infection, at some point in time, every state or every uh, region starts asking, is there spread outside this quarantine net? Uh, and I'm purposely not using the word community transmission because I think that's now something that's overused and has a million meanings depending on who or you know what is referring to it. So so I'll just uh, we 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 are sort of trying to use the word is there a spread outside the quarantine net? And what I mean by the quarantine net is that the the, the surveillance net of the government is basically all those the government has asked or the public system has asked to go into quarantine. Uh, and they may be uh, either uh, individuals who are suspected of having the disease, who are high likelihood to uh, have the disease, or who are contacts who have been traced uh, from individuals who are lab confirmed uh, with the disease. And, and this is your broadly your quarantine net. And, and the question that then begins to ask, the system begins to ask at some point is, is there a spread beyond this net? Uh, and, and if there is the spread, where is this spread happening? You know, where are the new epicenters? Uh, if you want to use uh, use that term, 
and what is the extent uh, of the spread and and of course uh, uh, like uh, you know the the in the earlier phase a frontline manager uh, would want to know what is this pattern you know how does it spread outside these uh, surveillance pools i mean what is happening in the community and and what do we know so 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 these are the sort of broad questions that i found uh, you know as the epidemic evolved uh, you know uh, coming to us uh, as a committee or you know uh, being discussed uh, and being debated of course they may not have been as explicitly put as these you know list of questions but inherently this was what uh, you know one uh, got a sense of now the data we have is rather limited to answer all these questions in essence we just had a number of positive test results uh, and and as of today i mean just yesterday we have received uh, you know antibody kits so as of now is just been rt pcr uh, you know the pcr uh, and a nucleic acid uh, you know uh, uh, test uh, that we had um, and 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 what we really have in terms of data was really the test the numbers that were done uh, the strategy we used to do those tests and some individual characteristics uh, and again uh, you know that data is uh, as you all know extremely tightly controlled uh, and and not uh, freely available uh, even within different uh, arms of the government in general and i think this is true of almost all states uh, that i know of and of course the second uh, sort of broad set of information i mean data we have is regarding deaths uh, and of course the various characteristics of these deaths and and, and so on uh, many states also uh, you know have uh, helped and i've i've seen especially karnataka and uh, i mean i think uh, uh, tamil nadu to some extent also gives you the the way in which different cases are linked uh, but again that data is not uh, freely available uh, in most states so we are left re- basically with Uh, test positives and deaths um while deaths is something uh, people are uh, extremely uh, i think uh, interested in and and i think take makes a lot of headlines i think as a uh, epidemiologist as a pub someone you know working with public health or uh, and and being uh, as part of discussions with demographers and others who who measure deaths uh, i think death is a extremely complex indicator uh, in an evolving epidemic because both the numerator as well as the denominator are constantly changing uh, who is tested changes over time and as we know now uh, i mean in the number of uh, controversies we've had in different states we also know that there are differences in definitions uh, and in attributions of death uh, deaths as uh, due to covid with covid because of covid uh, you know and 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 so on and so forth and overall uh death rates and you know some people use this overall death rate there's also this thing about uh, uh for example uh recently the uh, chief minister made an announcement in of kerala that we have 20000 less deaths this year for the same period than last year and this was seen as a, a, an indicator for you know uh, an effective control of the epidemic for example and and we know that this is a very problematic uh, sort, of, sort of or a complex uh, sort of uh, indicator to actually be grappling with uh, for the simple reason that uh, you know overall mortality uh, is is affected by so many things we know that uh, you know accidents have reduced a huge number homicides have reduced uh, pollution related deaths uh, have have reduced to a very very significant amount uh, or at least we you know pollution levels have reduced and therefore we expect pollution related deaths to reduce and so forth so on and so forth so so i mean deaths uh, you know as such as a as a way of following this epidemic uh, seems an extremely complex and not very uh, useful uh, way to go to answer the questions that we are setting out to answer and and uh, think probably the only reason why a death or or deaths may be of some use is to as an indicator that if we take deaths as a sort of a tip of the iceberg phenomenon then uh, you know deaths would reveal at least or indicate at least uh, that a large number of cases uh would have been there uh, you know for this one individual to have you know developed severe disease and die and therefore as an indicator as a proxy or a, or an indirect indicator of the number of cases that we should be expecting to see and 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 for that i think yes deaths are useful but i mean for 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 uh, for for most other reasons i think uh, death is a, a slightly uh, you know complex uh, indicator to use so i'm just setting this out and then setting this aside 
uh, to then focus on uh, what we really have and uh, which is basically the test positives. Um, now, uh, in the early phase, I think largely uh, testing was uh, not largely, I mean, almost 100% uh, of the tests were uh, on testing uh, symptomatic individuals, but symptomatic individuals who had a clear epidemiological link, and that was either to travel from uh, 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 a foreign country where there was, uh, you know, uh, 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 epidemics of, or there were outbreaks of COVID, uh, and or uh, they were contacts of a confirmed uh, case. Now, since the individuals coming in from different countries were not expected to automatically go into uh, uh, isol or quarantine, uh, in Kerala, this uh, started only on March, I think, 12th or March 15th, there was an order that all people get into quarantine uh, for international travel. And around 26th of March, uh, it became so for uh, domestic travel too. But I don't think there were such rules of automatic quarantine for any other state. So most testing was done on individuals. And uh, since these individuals were actually uh, out in the community, there was actually quite a, a high risk of uh, spread to other individuals uh, and uh, so on. And that was really the focus uh, of uh, the uh, testing uh, efforts. Uh, in terms of the effectiveness of uh, the quarantine, uh, which was the other question that uh, most uh, people uh, ask, um, I think one of the indicators that uh, as, uh, you know, uh, uh, a simple indicator that uh, was evolved was uh, what proportion of cases uh, are imported and what proportion of cases uh, are actually uh, due to secondary contact. And uh, at the end of around 500 cases uh, in Kerala, uh, which was uh, just before this latest surge of uh, cases from uh, abroad, uh, we had roughly uh, 350 of these uh, 500 uh, cases were uh, actually uh, imported and about 150 uh, uh, were actually secondary cases. And this was, in, this was um, uh, 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 taken uh, as an indicator that uh, Kerala has effectively, uh, you know, uh, 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 limited the spread of disease from those who were or those who had imported the disease into uh, the the local uh, population. Uh, similarly, there was a, a, a number, interesting number of studies, a few studies that uh, were done in Kerala, which actually looked at the nature of contact. And uh, in-depth epidemiological uh, uh, investigation of two of large outbreaks, one in Patanam Jitta and one in Trivandrum, actually showed that uh, almost all the contacts or those who became positive uh, from among the contacts of a given case, imported case were largely household contacts and uh, transmission took place in closed spaces. So whether it was you know, in the houses, uh, over people who had a lot of uh, you know, contact over dinner or you know, meals, and or their taxi drivers and and taxi drivers and closed spaces uh, became uh, you know uh, something quite early on very early in the epidemic sort of almost middle of march uh, you know the uh, international taxi drivers association started putting out advisories uh, you know mandating that the ac taxis uh, won't use their ac windows are open uh, so on and so forth so so again this was a very useful uh, set of uh, epidemiological in, uh, you know uh, uh, investigations around one or two uh, outbreaks that gave us a lot of data on on the nature of uh, contact uh, in the later phases of uh, the uh, epidemic the question really is now uh, you know is there spread outside this quarantine net and, and in a sense, uh, you know, uh, just uh, sort of coming straight to the point, there seems to be four uh, ways of trying to pick up these alternative or these uh, epicenters outside uh, this quarantine net. Uh, what was predict? I mean, what was used very early on, uh, in, including by ICMR by the end of March, was what was called the uh, severe acute respiratory illness or SARI surveillance. But as we know that uh, SARI uh, is basically a severe illness and by the time a patient comes with SARI, uh, you are actually uh, identifying uh, an individual who had acquired the infection about 14 days ago, 10 to 14 days ago. Uh, the Kerala government came up with the uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, strategy to do a surveillance on uh, population groups with high intensity of community interaction, which basically looked at health workers, police involved in COVID duties, ration shop uh, workers, um, and so on, 
uh, uh, with the basic assumption that these individuals would have a high intensity of community, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, contact, and therefore would be the earliest groups that would pick up the infection uh, if it is there uh, in 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 the community. Uh, and of course, many people have actually also talked about the need to go into actually looking at uh, influenza-like illnesses. Uh, you know, early and uh, simple uh, respiratory illnesses also need to be tested uh, so that you can pick up uh, individual cases and individual epidemics, uh, 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 epicenters uh, uh, early on uh, uh, compared to say something that you would do uh, with study. And government has also not, uh, not just illness or illness, but uh, influenza illness and respiratory illness in family clusters. So when one or two, three members of the family, uh, you know, uh, re report over a period of a couple of days to a PHC, is uh, supposed to, uh, you know, trigger a red flag and, uh, of course, uh, the response and so on. And of course, the fourth uh, issue, uh, a way of surveillance is the IDSP, and I'm going to leave that uh, for uh, Sundar uh, uh, to, 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 to uh, tackle. But in a sense, uh, I think while surveillance has definitely picked up, uh, and in Kerala at least, uh, there is this uh, general understanding that you know, surveillance does give us an information uh, that will help us, uh, you know, make sure, make a, get a better idea of the spread of the epidemic. Uh, the question is, uh, surveillance is just a tool uh, to point to, uh, you know, where uh, these possible epicenters are. Uh, and of course, the, the issue is always uh, how are we uh, um, uh, uh, going to actually respond uh, to these surveillance numbers. And that, of course, is still, uh, you know, uh, evolving uh, as, as such in, in, in many governments. So, of course, uh, uh, in, to the question that is the most uppermost in many politicians or bureaucrats' mind, uh, or at least they, they keep asking how much community spread, of course, that is something we are waiting for in terms of uh, antibody zero surveys, and uh, it is expected the uh, ICMR will release the results of their uh, 69 district study anytime. Uh, they were, it was supposed to be out today, so maybe over the next couple of days uh, we will get it, and, and and I think that will be there, of course, uh, to uh, answer that question. So in essence, what we saw is that an initial early uh, strong committed response to testing with a clear epidemiological link, uh, and then a gradual uh, sort of uh, uh, you know uh, setting up of surveillance with in Kerala's uh, case, a preference for high uh, com intensity community interaction as like the primary group, but also now, and over the last week, uh, we have actually started intensifying uh, surveillance of ILI, I mean, influenza-like illnesses, uh, and especially family clusters, like I mentioned, and now, and all of this, of course, is RT-PCR. Uh, and then those who are positive uh, on, picked up positive on surveillance, following that up with an epidemiological uh, investigation. Uh, so, so that is like broadly the way in which information needs and uh, strategies of the government evolved uh, over the epidemic. Uh, and, and I'll just wrap up now with a couple of slides uh, that just reflects uh, on, on what this whole process was. And to me, I think one of the key acts, uh, issues that uh, we had to deal with, uh, you know, when we were interacting with governments, when we were interacting with bureaucrats, is how do we see these numbers? And, and I'm putting C uh, in, you know, quote unquote, uh, you know, uh, in quotation marks, because I'm uh, because, like I said right at the beginning, I think the way these are problems are framed is so critical to, uh, you know, what numbers we use and how we use these numbers. So, so. Are we seeing numbers as a success or failure, or are we seeing numbers as a pattern in the natural history of an epidemic? And I think these two make a huge difference uh, in terms of the way these numbers are collected, used, interpreted, and uh, you know shared. Similarly, are numbers uh, a guide for evaluation, uh, or numbers or are they an evaluation again of success or failure, or are they actually uh, you know a guide for action? Uh, you know, uh, or an affirmation of strategy. And, and again, uh, you know, a public health person may say, listen, this is a guide for action, but many a time you have bureaucrats uh, and politicians using these numbers uh, as a success of failure indicators, which then muddies the whole situation in terms of, you know, uh, data, and especially 
uh, when it comes to transparency and 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 data uh, sharing so in fact one of the key challenges we faced was actually trying to shift the emphasis from seeing numbers as success failure to actually seeing it as a you know a natural history of an epidemic so a shift from an emphasis on total positives to the number now and in fact uh, the government of kerala now regularly puts out this number saying how many of the total that are positive today actually are local contacts and and focusing more on the local contacts and the secondary spread rather than on just the number of positives who are among the imported cases which is definitely going to increase and and shift in therefore a purely history related approach uh, which was you know very persistent because it was easy it was definite you had you were able to put guidelines to shifting to a surveillance based approach where you have to be flexible you have to be nimble you have to be agile and shifting from you know a sari based surveillance which is a very clear cut indicator where an individual comes to hospital to moving out into the community to decentralizing your surveillance and looking at an influenza like uh, you know illness uh, surveillance and of course there are related uh, challenges in logistics uh, the challenges of data collection in community settings and of course the challenges in uh, the interpretation of data my last slide is a uh, a challenge to all i have said so far it basically asks the question that i think the discussion around covid has largely been too covid focused and all we are constantly talking about are deaths and tests related to covid and uh, i am just presenting here uh, as a sort of parting shot that i think this is a very very narrow focused uh, approach Uh, for most of our discussions on uh, information needs and uh, this is a, a framework that uh, three of us have just uh, put out it's been accepted for uh, uh, publication in the bmj global health where we have uh, actually are talking about the need to go beyond a focus on covid to look at a public health focus which would include covid and the continued provision of all essential health services as well as social protection for those who are at high risk or who are unable to uh, actually uh, you know fulfill those uh, physical distancing and other criteria or who are uh, uh, adversely affected or impacted by the various strategies that the government uh, uh, mandates uh, like lockdowns and so on and and i think there is enough of discussion of all this and our argument basically and i won't be going through this very dense slide but is to say that we, it's not enough just to have information or data points about covid but we now need to start bringing in the large number of data that is already available or that should be available in order for us to actually be able to answer the question of uh, the answer the question in a larger public health framing which includes not just covid and covid related activities which are absolutely important in the present state but also whether we are doing enough to protect the right to essential services for non covid related medical conditions whether we are continuing to look at the social determinants of health and whether we have an overarching equity consideration in everything we do uh, so finally the key challenge is making sure everyone is asking and answering the same question how we frame the terms uh, success and using data for evaluation or using data for action broadening the scope of our action beyond a very narrow covid uh, related uh, covid focused uh, approach and ultimately i think we are asking the question of the interface between politics government and science thank you very much thanks rakan for this very nice beginning to the symposium uh, very well articulated points uh, one quick question that uh, came was basically about how, what about healthcare workers so how do you so how do you look at healthcare workers and within that uh, framework that you had posed yeah okay so so healthcare workers are actually uh, one of the top i mean in fact they are the first uh, group uh, who uh, come in this uh, uh, in this category called uh, um, 
uh, groups that are uh, that have high intensity community uh, you know uh, involvement uh, 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 community uh, uh, mixing uh, and we have two groups of uh, health workers who are regularly uh, tested in terms of surveillance uh, so every week we have a random test uh, of around uh, i think about 25 to 30 doctors uh, who are uh, doctors nurses uh, you know uh, 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 maintenance staff, serve the sanitary workers and so on, who are working in COVID centers and who are working in non-COVID centers. So, so healthcare workers are absolutely important uh, and uh, they are taken as like a very, very key group, uh, you know, in, in looking at that. And more recently, uh, there has been a, ten, uh, there has been an, uh, you know, uh, a, a, a sense of actually de defining and uh, describing this as a separate group and reporting this separately in terms of uh, actually following the epidemic. So thank you. Uh, maybe we'll come back to the discussion at the end of all the presentations. So may I now request Dr. Sundaram to start his presentation. So he will be talking about disease surveillance programs, which is exactly what uh, Rafael was also talking about. So it's a nice shift from one topic to another. So Dr. Sundaram, you can start. Your audio, your audio is still mute. Right. Is the screen visible now? No, not yet. Yeah, we are good. Okay, let me uh, get to, I'm going to focus a lot upon uh, the topic as given to me, disease surveillance program. I'm happy that someone somewhere asked me to speak on it because it's really uh, very, very surprising. One of the most surprising aspects of this entire three, four months is how little attention disease surveillance has got. And part of the reason for this is because disease surveillance is the heart of the international health regulations, which is a binding treaty that binds every country that has signed and India has signed also. The WHO has only one treaty, as different from declarations, treaties have a binding value. That means you, you can actually, you have a uh, legally obliged to follow that. And one of them is this. And there is a system that actually comes and monitors to see whether the IDSP is effectively functioning and there's a whole mechanism over here. Now, something very, very peculiar happened to the IDSP in uh, India. And before I come to that, let me uh, start with first explaining what the IDSP is, because I find that very few people, not only, not only in a uh, larger scientific community, but even within the people who have been responding to the COVID-19 pandemic at the leadership level, we're not aware of the IDSP and what it actually means. So the disease surveillance has two functions. One is to measure disease burden so as to guide pro policies and programs. And another is really effective response to epidemic situations, to outbreaks of diseases. So these two uh, things have been described in this larger chart. One is the surveillance functions and the early warning functions. And underneath that, you see two squares, indicator-based surveillance and event-based surveillance. Now, these are buzzwords. Indicator-based is what you would, in some sense, uh, relate to data. And the difference between data and indicator, I'll come back later, is everything for us. But at some point, the issue is of indicator base, which looks at a regular collection of information from the population and uses it to predict trends, to monitor programs, to look at the burden of disease, and to react to epidemics, identify and react to epidemics, as different from when there is a sudden outbreak of an unknown disease, there are a few deaths, you don't wait for even this weekly report, you immediately give a, so that's an event-based surveillance. So this is broadly the architecture of this. This is another way 
of expressing it. The case-based surveillance and the event-based surveillance. One is based on data and its analysis. The other is really even one-off reporting with people uh, give a certain uh, information. It presses an alert, it leads to an action. So this is a very simple conceptual basis. Now, India's program is more than a few decades old, but the latest program that as we know it is from the National Rural Health Mission when it was revisited and strengthened. And I know a bit about it because I was party to it. From about 2007, the strengthening started, but really after the 25-year plan, it has been further strengthened. So these are the number of notifiable diseases that are regularly reported. And I have marked in red a few ones which would present, COVID would present as, it would present as a fever of unknown origin, it would present as an influenza-like illness, or it would present as a pneumonia, which is at some point the various forms in which you would expect it. But you can see the other diseases, measles, diphtheria, Chicken gunia, uh, chicken gunia, dengue, meningitis. There's a lot of diseases on which there is a regular reporting system in place. Now, this reporting happens from three levels. One is called a Form S, which is suspect cases, which are health workers reporting. 1.5 lakh, 150,000 centers send this report every week. There is then another form called Form P or presumptive cases, where you have to have a doctor making a clinical diagnosis. And remember, in the world of medicine, clinical diagnosis can be more effective than laboratory in many, many circumstances, and doctors act upon it. So a presumptive diagnosis is a very powerful tool. And this is reported in from close to 50,000 centers. That's all your primary health centers, CHCs, government hospitals, and a fair number of private hospitals. There is a problem that we don't get number from everything, but there is a form. And form L is the laboratory confirmed cases. It reports from the laboratory. Other than that, there are many places, including news media reports are filed in. Now, once you have this, there is a whole process of data transmission, compilation, analysis, and display. There's a central control room in the National Center for Disease Control, which is India's CDC. So it is NCDC. And from here, they can actually have conferences with all the various centers, and they at least down to the P form level but even the S form at necessary and you have this. The S form of course does not really travel all the way to the national center the block or district is where the analysis ends. But form P and L you can go down and look at every primary health care center or unit equivalent across the place and this happens weekly. Look at this. This is the district surveillance unit. Then it goes up to the SSU the state surveillance unit and the cent central surveillance unit you can see the sources of data from which they get this data. Subcenters, PHCs, CHCs, district hospital, medical colleges, corporate hospitals, a whole lot of things, and the private houses. Not saying it's complete, but at some point, one must understand the architecture before one can comment upon it. Now, this was the planned deliverable. And at some point, about 95% of districts report weekly data on epidemic prone diseases, that list that I shown you, every week. And outbreaks will be investigated and responded to, and a network of laboratories provide strengthening for it. And the last line actually shows 36, a modest number, but you have zoonotic, zoonotic diseases and veterinary care also being integrated in. Now, this is a sort of report. I've got up to 2015 because that was the time I was part of the monitoring visit, the review of this program. But now there is much more. I mean, at some point, you can see these are actually disease outbreaks that are reported. Okay, and all of these at some point are action. Of course, all of us within the system know that there is incompleteness in reporting and there is a considerable degree of under-reporting. Having said that, this is still a substantial amount of reporting that occurs on this. 
Now, if the IDSP is one set of data source, one must understand what is the other set of data sources that we have within the system. The two main ones that I would like to draw your attention to is the mortality data from civil registration and vital statistics and the health management information systems. I've put in bracket generic because there is a thing called the HMIS, but all this malaria has its own disease surveillance program, TB, tuberculosis has its program, your HIV has its program, your immunization uh, RCH programs have their program. So there is an even IDSP in that billing is lifted as one of these management information programs because the information is used for management, but it gives you a read for, for example, newborn deaths, for example, the number of patients who were tested for a particular sort of diseases, a lot of information, even death information is in this flow. This information is still available. For example, people who can look at it, no newborn deaths but in Tamil Nadu increased because it is there on the data portal and you can actually see these data on real time on this particular issue and demographic and health surveys are also there. And the National Sample Survey Office the last two are surveys. They have a different role, but they are very useful to validate the first two. You can actually compare these and they can arrive at a level of truth. The problem with mortality reporting, the upper line is birth reporting. The mortality reporting is low. Now it's about 75%. But in many of the states we are interested in Tamil Nadu, Maharashtra, it's upward of 90%. So this is the cause of death. This is a mortality data. And there are many reasons why this is an extremely important source. This data is readily available potentially, meaning the data is collected and it is digitized. Okay. Then we have the issue that of what is called the sample registration survey. Now, here what happens is from this mortality data, a certain sample is rechecked by a visiting supervisor once in six months. And they go through a oral discussion about all the deaths in the village. And then they fix it with a presumptive cause. And this is leads to a certain understanding of causes of death. And at some point, this is a large sample. It's a 7 million sample. And this has been reported thrice. There is after 2013, no report available. But until that time, you could actually get a, a fairly good report. Now, this is not very reliable for finding out whether it was cancer of the pancreas or cancer of the lungs that he did with. But it is very useful for finding out age and gender related. So in the 15 to 45, in under one. So all our infant mortality and maternal mortality and our data on under five mortality, etc., comes from this particular survey. And this data is available on uh, many formats on that. And there are a number of things that one can do. The last one is the medical certification of cause of death. Many public health experts would swear by that. I myself am much more worried that that's not going to go too far. But the first one, the death registries, there's some degree of detail and not going to. The first is form 22A, this is 44A. That, there is a problem why the medical certification is very difficult to take off. But with some tweaks, we can actually get a fairly good understanding from the basic death registration about mortality data. In HMIS, I was telling you there is the HMIS, there is the RCH data, then the disease control programs, IDSP, then the state systems, then the Ayushman Bharat, the entire data that it collects from the insurance schemes, the number of people hospitalized. So there is an each state has over 30 such IT programs which are running, collecting, churning out data on a very regular basis. There is a mountain of data rather untouched by the human mind. But at some point, it really covers a whole lot of data. There's a lot of overlaps. And eventually, these data don't talk to each other. There's almost no interoperability within this. Now, one of the most common reasons attributed for not using this data, and a whole lot of public health scholars will tell you this, is because if there is garbage in, then will be garbage out. If the a and fakes the data, if the doctor tells false lies, then you sit and analyze it. They are all misreporting. So what's the use? The data is not reliable. 
that's a very, very, the less you know, the more convinced you are about that argument. But actually, that's complete garbage. Um, if you think, for example, in COVID-19, is which is the thing where all of you have come into public health, and you would understand. If you think ANNs and doctors are uh, filling up false forms and faking it, that's completely not true. So if the numbers up, uh, upstairs are unreliable, there's a much more complex process for that, and it's certainly not on the peripheral provider. Not to say that they are the paragon of truth, but there is no stake for them in falsifying a whole set of data one or two important, but that I'm not going into. So a lot of the problems are what are called managerial problems, like we don't have staff, the IT system didn't run, this sort of thing. But there is a core problem which you may be interested in, which we call data-related problems, and I'll come back to. And there are institutional problems. There are reasons why what uh, Rakal was referring to is the politics of knowledge and information. The knowledge has a huge value. There is a political stake. There is power games around it. There are narratives constructed around it. Oh, this state has done very well in this. We have done the best among all the nations. So there are huge political narratives built around the data. And at some point, this data quality has an uh, interest. To actually find the way these mechanical systems interact with issues like the politics, take some understanding, domain understanding on this. Now, if I have to go into this data quality and also not to lose your interest completely because we are not talking COVID, let me come back and try to explain some of this with the COVID-19 so that you can understand how and relate at least to the COVID-19 data. But I'm using COVID-19 to explain the problem of surveillance, but you can use this to understand COVID-19 also. So the first and most interesting thing about the IDSP is every week it has put up a report from 2010 to now. And just when the epidemic out, uh, took off, in the last week of January, first week of February, it puts out its weekly report. I think the weekends, February 2nd. And it puts out and it documents India's first three cases of COVID-19. If you read that documentation, it's really well done. As a professional, I'm proud of whoever made that documentation. Somebody in Kerala needs to be given a medal for him, what he wrote. And then the portal, which has been functioning all along, goes completely silent. There is another flu surveillance uh, system within that, which has been giving monthly reports great relevance and each month it compares it with the similar month of the previous year and the year before that because this is a seasonal flu that they are talking of and COVID-19 we all know is clinically almost indistinguishable from the flu so at a spot you would be able to have an understanding if that was in function the last report from that is February 24th and it goes functional it's like having a fire station that you have built in a city to put out fires. And the moment the fire started, you decided to send off the fire stations into some unknown place from where nothing happens and you don't know what is happening. This was meant to actually guide epidemic action. And this is, as I told you, an elaborate system built over a long time. So what really happened and what is it that we will need to understand in institutions? So it's interesting. One of the first things that happened was the ICMR, by virtue of the fact that it had COVID-19 laboratories under its control. It's a new virus. So the laboratories that are under IDSP don't know to test for COVID-19. They can test for flu, H1N1. They can't test for that. So ICMR's 48 labs are geared to test it. They start off with that and start presenting the reports. Then the issue becomes much bigger. They become contested. The ministry decides that how can the ICM work? And they come in and this. The ministry has a different format. And even today, even today, the ICMR reports don't match the MOHFW report because what now the ICMR does is just collect the test positives. But there are maybe the same sample being retested. That's one particular issue. But other than that also, what happened in terms of deaths, what happened in terms of ventilators, what happened is not within the ICMR portal. It comes within this. And this is what is transmitted up a particular chain. And senior bureaucrats become in charge of the chain. And they continue to collect this uh, report. 
there are obvious problems with this for example the mortality rate gujarat has a high mortality rate tamil nadu has a extraordinarily good mortality rate both are really suspicious at some point gujarat's rate could be because the number of cases they tested symptomatics who were not fatal mild and moderate was low that's the most likely reason why gujarat has a 6% and the reason why tamil nadu is under a, is got a, such a good mortality rate is because it is part of uh, it is in fact having very uh, poor death reporting and again for institutional reasons so yesterday if you look at my news 18 i, I it happened yesterday so i can tell you about it in news 18 i went to town on this particular issue because we have a number of reports which i was had enough to present on to the thing that people are actually turning away very sick patients sending them away to private care or elsewhere especially if they are likely to die because you don't want to spoil your statistic because we have built two narratives we have built in india two narratives which political narratives that we want to keep one is this bold lockdown done by this bold leader as a result of which india has the most remarkable success not comparable with anywhere success in containing cases we just deferred the epidemic but at some point this is one narrative and we have done this maybe cases go but we have prevented community transmission community transmission by its definition was there even at the time we did a lockdown but somewhere we stick to this and as a result using a very circuitous logic we do not test symptomatics who do not have a contact history and are outside hot spots because by definition it can't be there so we won't test them and because you don't test them you can never find them there and therefore you can sustain your political narrative by the way in which you approve a testing protocol on that so you have this and similarly test positivity rates our test positive rate as good as south korea again it depends so there is a problem and similarly the absence of evidence so how do you really understand this and i am going to one particular thing now let me just explain this slide a bit and you can see why almost all the indicators that we use are far less than reliable without at any time saying that any peripheral provider is faking the data it's really in the way data flows and gets analyzed now what we report is a data element it's a data it is not a indicator what we report is the total number of covid-19 positive cases but these come from the cases we have tested and for testing we have 12 groups we can have a person with a travel history who is asymptomatic we can have a person with a travel history who is symptomatic we can have contacts of person with travel history they don't test much but some places they do asymptomatic or symptomatic they can have a contact of positive person that is a covid-19 positive person contact who is asymptomatic or symptomatic then high risk occupational groups doctors police persons whatever you define it and that has a issue and high risk patient groups like cancer patients or very old people nursing home people etc now plus there is symptomatic people without any of these above history within hot spots that you can test and outside hot spots symptomatic people as of date today you can't test by the protocol among all these different tests i would have said that the symptomatic outside hotspot is perhaps the most single useful now for being able to understand at least new clusters before when they are small and they are emerging rather we do that for malaria we test a certain minimum number of cases in any place of fever just take any fever and test a minimum number of fevers we have to test a minimum number of fevers and among them we look at the positivity rate and if it rises then we sense an epidemic so it is the mix between the clinical syndrome and the proportion of people with clinical symptoms that we submit to a laboratory test that gives you a sense of what happens in the population now suppose in one state we have tested a lot with travel history and very few people who are symptomatic or we have tested a lot of asymptomatics and 
thing. So you can say in Tamil Nadu, we have a lot of asymptomatics. It doesn't occur to them because they are testing contacts of people, positive persons, and they've defined the contacts so loosely so that even casual contacts are being tested, whereas only close contacts, more than 15 minutes without a mask within six feet need to be tested. You would find there is a lot of negatives on that. The least we can say is these data are just not comparable because the, the data element is a numerator, but the denominators come from 12 different groups. If we could even say the positivity within each of these 12 groups, we would be able to actually get a good sense of what is happening in the population. Now, this is the interesting thing about our whole system. This data is available. What? It's available even as of now. But it will be a really, really challenging task to actually get at that. Somewhere in between, you will find data, but not quite enough. Suddenly, you will get lumped up from India, all over India. ICMR will bring out some data on this, but it will still not be enough to actually manage within a district. If this data was available for every district, we could really do a great job of managing it. We would know which places to have social restriction, which places not to have. Anyway, geographical containment is a nonsense. But we could have the rest of these things we could have in many ways. But what we don't have is actually the denominators from which the positivities emerge. As a result, we have a problem with every single indicator that we have. The cases per million, when we compare with any other country, most countries test all symptomatics, not all. There are countries which don't test symptomatics. But if you were comparing with, say, a South Korean or a thing, every person with symptomatic has almost a right to be tested, irrespective of contact history. And your comparison, when you, since by protocol, you rule out everybody, 80% of cases outside hotspots will not get tested, even by definition. Deaths, actually, what happens, as I was saying, is in Tamil Nadu, in many places, there's a whole drive to be able to mask these deaths. And there is a big problem about the number of different ways. So, for example, a case which is suspected, where the test has been sent, and then the case is discharged or leaves against medical advice because they are not, will not be counted as a death because at some point they would actually, because the test was not positive. Now that's just a little uh, uh, trick about it. Or for example, you saw Safdarjang Hospital reported to the central ministry and not to Delhi because it was therefore not counted in Delhi, but it wasn't counted in the central ministry also. If you see in Tamil Nadu, I don't know about this, but in places like Dengue, etc., corporation will have a report. You will have a report in from ICMR labs. You, and they won't add it up. Railway hospital would not have given the report here. They will say, so I'm not saying this happens, but there are ways in which, institutional ways in which these happen. And similarly, case fatality rates. In case fatality rate, there's a bigger denominator problem. Because case fatality means of the number of people who tested positive on May 20th, how many people died by May 30th? If you use the case, the deaths today and the cases today and calculate case fatality rate, you will have an unusually low rate. Because a lot of people who have since got infected have not yet had the time to die because dying takes 7 to 10, 15 days. And therefore, you're using the wrong denominator. And if you use the right denominator, we would have a case fatality rate about 6%. If you do 15 days or 4 to 5%, which is internationally comparable. There is no reason to be surprised by this, that the virus behaves in India precisely as it behaves anywhere else in the world. Okay, it never figured out why it should behave differently. And it behaves that. But because of the ways in which we calculate and compute indicators and we compute particularly the what is known as the denominator issue, we have a situation where we will miss many of these things. Now, in a disease surveillance approach, we would have, if I would have actually think, if we had continued with IDSB, why should I say I? The international health regulations and its understanding of architecture would have continued. 1.5 lakh centers would have continued, filed an S report where it would have said number of fever cases. 
Now, when, when one village has a spike of five fevers, it won't show up in India level. It won't show up in a billion cases. But in that local block, they can find out, they can go there, they can contact trace, they can isolate. They don't need it to become very large and then say, oh, Coimbedo happened. You could have found it much earlier if you had it from that particular area. Similarly, 50,000 centers file presumptive report. Wherever there is a P positive, the laboratory must follow. Now, the very simple, if you have been reporting, if every district hospital, taluk hospital, number of COVID-like cases are reported, that is simply ILI, fever cases, never bother about testing. And you see any small spike over there. Between last week and this week, there is 10 more cases uh, increasing. Then you know that you must go there because when it is 10, you can stop the spread. Otherwise, you learn about it when it is 100 and deaths have started occurring and it's nowhere impossible to hide. In, uh, in uh, Madhya Pradesh, they are following something which is called the Ram Borose mode. I got that from one of my student epidemiologists there. What happens is in distant villages, in remote areas, you start getting cases. They seal off the village. And inside the village, what happens? Ram Barose happens. In some sense, you just leave it to what it is. Nobody outside at some point, you can seal that off. Because your reporting, your absence of reporting is not really garnered over there. But if you were to take testing there, there is no criteria to take testing there because it's not your defined hotspot. So unless it becomes a hotspot and enough people die, it won't become a hotspot. That's really silly. And when the disease spreads into the rural areas, as it is doing now, if we had this system, we would have been on top of the problem. But now we can haplessly blame the hapless migrants, having first punished them for spreading it also, without having put in place a system. And similarly, the laboratories, this would have been an issue. For mortality, all-cause mortality, fever-related mortality, deaths testing positive for COVID-19, independent death review, medical audit, I called for it yesterday. There's a serious problem, including LAMA, left against medical advice, tracking recovery, helplines. There's a whole things that we need to do to capture. Let me state it again. What's happening in deaths is a denial of care. I am saying this with serious responsibility and I am uh, uh, somewhat uh, think that Kejriwal has been in the press saying this within their internet fight that if a person goes to a hospital with symptoms, then it is a responsibility of the government to see that he is transferred, if admission is not possible, that he is transferred by a suitable ambulance to the place where he can be admitted. If they say no beds, you please go to the nearest private sector hospital, that's not on. Similarly, it's not on for private sector hospitals also to discriminate between cases that can pay or not pay or for whatever reasons refuse admission. If they do not want to admit whatever the reason, they are duty bound to call the ambulance. There are public ambulances available or use their ambulance and transport that case here. Now what is happening is a good number of sick cases are falling between these tools and dying on en route. That's really a terrible statement to make. But today, last two weeks, this is, I think, the problem that we are grappling with. And Kejriwal has spoken about it yesterday. So it's just not my aversion. But I am saying this with good information from a number of people working within the field. So you have really got to look at what we can do about this. And we need to ensure that COVID-19 is notifiable. Tamil Nadu has notified it at March 24th, but deaths, I don't know. Completeness of reporting. Every SP, any SO report not coming in should be investigated. We must have an 100% reporting. A nil reporting should be there. Provide that raw anonymized data with all fields so that the denominators are available so that we can actually work out what proportion of different population subgroups are positive and real-time reporting of mortality from CRVS. The report, why should it come four to five years later? It's digitized. For heaven's sake, give us a report of the people who are dying between 15 to 60, 60 to 70 in this district in the previous month. It can be done and establish, finally, conversations over data. So having said that, the people with the clinical data, the mortality data from the CRVS, they will need to have a weekly meeting 
where they will need to share their data, ponder over the data. Maybe there's a data problem. Maybe there's an institutional problem and you have to establish this and you will need to establish a community of that. So there is a, to be the whole way in which this data management is done by a series of IS officers at the top, getting all the data, giving a pronouncement on the day, one raw number without any sense of denominators, where the numbers are sourced. Maybe at that meeting, that's what they can do. I, I'm not being uh, unreasonable on that. But somewhere there has to be a larger sense of how data is managed to be able to get on top of the problem. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sundaram. It was very nice uh, coverage of the surveillance program and the shortcomings. Actually, we have run out of time, so we'll probably come back to discussing the various topics uh, uh, to uh, later during the presentations, after the presentations. So next we'll move on to Brahmar Mukherjee. So thanks Brahmar for uh, getting up very early in Michigan to talk to us. And so uh, Brahmar will be talking to us about uh, data science approach to whatever data is there in the public domain. So Sundar, can you please stop sharing the screen? So yes, then I can share. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Can you hear me okay, Pinaki? Yeah, you can start. All right. So thank you everyone. Uh, good morning to everyone in US and good evening to everyone in India. So I really appreciate this opportunity of uh, presenting in this particular forum because this is a very important forum uh, to provide uh, objective information as Indian scientists and unbiased uh, our opinion and assessment, filtering out all political biases and agenda. So uh, I think this is important conversation between the public and the scientists and uh, the government. So we are in a really unprecedented time. Uh, I really learned a lot from Rakhal's presentation and Sundar's presentation. So I basically wanted to keep listening and not really talk about our work, but I'll share my journey with you rather than talking about the nitty gritty details, uh, I'll uh, share a narrative uh, why uh, I started to do this work with my team and where we are now and what do we need as modelers, which will probably give you an idea about what data the, the theme of this morning and that what kind of data do we need and what are the data imperfections here and what can we do as statisticians and modelers uh, to do the best job with the data that we have, because we cannot really give up. We cannot really complain uh, that the sampling biases and the selection errors and the misclassifications exist. Uh, we have methods and we can try our best. You know, we put the best foot forward to, uh, to tackle a complicated problem. So uh, I, as I said that this is, uh, I'm presenting actually uh, on behalf of a study group, which uh, I started in University of Michigan. I still remember the day we started uh, this study group. It was March 16th. It was the day quarantine had started in Michigan. And all of us, mostly uh, students and scholars from Indian origin were stuck at home. Uh, we were worried about our parents. We were worried about India. And everybody felt such a shock uh, because we were, uh, I think the last three months have probably been a failure of our collective social to social, uh, social imagination. So all of us were actually uh, really concerned and scared. So we tried to repurpose our energy into something meaningful and provide our service as quarantine data scientists. So this is where all that start. And the team consists of members, now this has grown uh, from University of Connecticut, University of Michigan, Delhi School of Economics, Johns Hopkins University, uh, and so uh, University of Amherst now. So we, we keep growing in terms of people's interest in contributing. Uh, so before I begin my talk, I'd really like to take a moment to thank the frontline health workers who are actually uh, really risking their lives, going to work each day. I have many physician friends at University of Michigan. I work very closely with the doctors here. Uh, this is a tremendous time and I just want to uh, share my deep respect uh, from Detroit, Michigan to Dharavi, Mumbai. Uh, this is, there is some commonality in terms of the challenges that we are facing, uh, particularly with the frontline health workers. 
Uh, so I just wanted to share some of the work that we did. We wrote a series of Medium articles. And you know, I am a typical academic. I never really thought about public engagement or writing pieces which are not peer reviewed. And this is the first time I wrote a um, Medium article. And the need was really to get the message out there uh, in quick turnaround time. And so we published our first Medium article on March 20, and there has been a, a trilogy of Medium articles since then. Uh, and I am most actually uh, fortunate to have built this site, covind19.org, which is much more nuanced for epidemiologic modeling because it has all the daily forecasts as well as uh, ob observed data. And I'm going to share some products from this site with you today, uh, which could be helpful. And I really look for your feedback to improve the science. Uh, so, uh, and then, um, they, as I mentioned, there is a trilogy of papers. And our first paper came out in the Harvard Data Science Reviews special edition on COVID-19. Uh, for data scientists, I think this is a wonderful uh, issue. It's all online. And there are some fabulous papers talking about the specific issues that we have heard since morning that what can we do uh, in order to fix the denominator and fix the numerator? Are there other sources of data that we can use in order to improve our predictions and our estimations? Um, so I strongly encourage people to look at this issue. There are, uh, I, I think you'll learn a lot. So I start with the caveat, and I, this has been uh, said many times, stated many times since morning and also in the media and uh, in all papers, uh, that what we are working with is highly imperfect. So the coronavirus case counts because different states have adopted different testing strategies. So they are by no means a random sample from a population. And uh, when we put them on the same graph, it's almost committing a statistical sin because they are not the same. And different states, even different districts have adopted different policies and reporting of deaths, reporting of cases, testing. So it's really not comparing apples to apples. It's really uh, comparing apples to something uh, very uh, different, uh, not even oranges. Uh, so I, I want to uh, really point that, but with that caveat, I'm going to share some of the modeling story uh, that we have. This has been a tremendous journey. I want to share that story with you a little bit. So I'm going to talk about a little bit about the uh, pre-lockdown phase and then talk about uh, post-lockdown analysis. And then how do we translate all of this tsunami of data uh, this numerical forecasting, all the R values or the doubling time into a strategic vision for policymakers. Because after all, our goal is not just to contain a COVID-19 pandemic. As scientists, we really want to control uh, the total degree of human loss and suffering. Uh, I, sometimes we lose a sight of that, I think, in this uh, maze of information. So when we started, this was March 19th, India had 536 cases and 11 deaths. Um, and it may seem like this is, a, 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 this is not a situation early uh, precaution, but what we had seen in the US, the explosion uh, that forced us to think about uh, building a prediction model for India. And India, it has been mentioned, it is different or same. It, it, definitely the spread of the virus is probably not any different, uh, but the population demographics, the underlying uh, construct of the society, which is a real big part of this controlling this pandemic and across the world, you see uh, this huge series of natural experiments that different countries are performing differently. Uh, and it is, it is related to policy, but also what is the composition? So uh, when we looked at the, uh, you know, it, uh, we all know, and I don't want to reiterate that India has a youthful population, uh, but the healthcare system is fragile. There is a large number of uninsured people. Uh, there are a large number of people who are at high risk for comorbidities, which have been associated with fatal outcomes for COVID-19. Um, a selected so risk stratification as an epidemiologist, I'd really like to reiterate that, that most of the population uh, getting this disease are going to be okay. But we really need to risk stratify and prioritize and create prediction model of who is the most vulnerable, where who should we protect, and where should we test more often. <laughs> so uh, for that, so we came up with our first predict prediction model. So this is a, from our first medium article, uh, <clears throat> which has been really uh, uh, the start of this whole process for us. And at the time, uh, standing on March 20, we predicted that India will have about um, 
60,000 cases by uh, May 15. And uh, the confidence interval was actually uh, quite high. And I'd like to really point out because nobody reports confidence intervals or the tremendous uncertainty associated with these predictions, which is very important to underscore as modelers and be honest about it. So our projection was under no intervention. And we said that there would be 900,000 cases. Um, and then within a day, actually, our prediction, so. Uh, and we published this reported and there is a 30 page report associated with the medium article on the center website and I woke up the next morning and uh, obviously the media picked up the numbers and so uh, and within one day I think from March 20 to 24 the predictions from 60,000 had changed to 97,000 by May 15th and uh, we are and so but please do remember this was our projections uh, in terms of no intervention. But even with lockdown, we were somewhere in this ballpark about 100,000 cases on May 15. So when people say that the models were roughly accurate, that's not quite true because uh, we severely underestimated at that time point. Um, I, I'm going to talk more about the lockdown effect and what the assessment has been. So since then, we have all witnessed a very complex societal story. And I think it would be really unfair to just focus on the epidemiology part and ignore the social crisis. So we have seen, and I don't need to talk about this, the migrant workers, we have seen the societal uh, societal gestures of trying to come together. Um, we have seen that like, you know, how the lockdown was announced and uh, with, with limited time for preparing the population to get ready for the, and the system and the infrastructure. So what is lockdown? I have been really studying hard what is lockdown as a non-pharmaceutical intervention in public health. So, uh, and this has been also said many, many times that lockdown does not get rid of the virus. It's not a cure, it's a, it's a time. It's a time to really uh, build our infrastructure in terms of surveillance, in terms of testing strategy, uh, preparing the healthcare infrastructure. And data can be used not just to predict cases, but also to chase the track of this pandemic throughout the country so that we can optimally deploy the finite resources that we have in a strategic way. Uh, and then I think that, you know, we have to think about the economy. And uh, in my talk, I'm going to talk mostly about the uh, public health aspects of it, but then at the end, I'll allude to uh, the, the problem that you cannot disentangle other deaths and economic crisis from the public health problem. And then during this time, of course, uh, we have done a good job in uh, keeping the supply chain go grow going, but uh, lockdown is cannot be a long-term strategy. So you need a long-term strategy as you come out of the lockdown and the government and the scientists have been working really hard on that. Uh, but I think it has been uh, sort of diffused across uh, different parts of the country and uh, different uh, political agendas. <clears throat> so the, uh, the analogy that resonates with me about lockdown as a prevention measure is that, and the prediction model. So I think about the prediction models as so we knew, we knew when we were looking at the world that uh, a, a tidal wave is coming, a big problem is coming, and different models could argue that whether the tidal wave is coming in the afternoon or in the evening, or what is the height of the tidal wave, but that does not really change our strategy in terms of policy. We had a picket fence in March to deal with this tidal wave, and we needed this time in order to really build watchtowers, dams, uh, escape boats so that we can deal with this tiger tidal wave better. So to me, that's the best analogy for a lockdown. Uh, it's definitely not a strategy to get rid of the virus. It will definitely come back. We need a mechanism to arrest it. So uh, I, so, so the questions that you might ask as a statistician, as a modeler, as an epidemiologist, that how many cases? This is the, this is the thing that people keep asking. What is your projection? Uh, and I, I'm, I'm going to be saying that, like, you know, I'm quite skeptical about these models and projections, uh, but I am actually a firm believer in the takeaway me messages all of these models have given us. Um, and the relative uh, lessons that you learn rather than the absolute numbers. Uh, and then the questions like, when can you see, when can you expect to see the curve turn and turn the corner and a decline in fatalities and in the number of cases? Uh, what does a successful lockdown look like and has India achieved it? 
and what how should we return uh, exit strategy uh, i don't think normalcy is the right word because with the world is not going to be uh, normal we how do we adapt to the adapt to the new normal is the question uh, so uh, how what can we learn so lockdowns, lockdowns across different parts of the uh, world for how, how they have uh, uh, performed. And then what are we seeing in India? So this is in, and the degree of lockdown and the degree of intervention has been quite different, right? Across the countries. Uh, so this is China and they had a very uh, strict centralized quarantine centralized isolation lockdown. And we can see that we can see the effect uh, within about uh, two to three weeks in terms of the number of cases going down and the number of recoveries. And you can see that even after that, there are little bumps and increases, but those are mostly imported cases that we are seeing uh, in China. So this is South Korea. I think to me, this is the really the role model in terms of how to control this pandemic and uh, in a data-driven way. Uh, there is no lockdown and testing and contact tracing has been the key uh, using, as you know, um, mobility data and, uh, uh, and, and tracking credit card information. So we can talk about the privacy and the ethics related to that, but they have done a tremendous job. And even after they came out when they have uh, super spread events, uh, there have been spikes, but they have been able to contain it. So that's the goal, that if the number of cases go down enough, then your capacity of contact tracing can actually contain those cases. And so they have been very successful without really uh, having a, even a shutdown of their airports or travel ban and lockdown. Uh, Italy, Italy waited to introduce the lockdown and we have seen a large number of fatalities. It's also the age structure of the population, uh, several other factors, but because they waited, um, they had a large and larger number of fatalities, also older population uh, with certain comorbidities. But we have seen the curve turn the corner. We have seen the number of cases go down. Uh, and let us, and, and this is data up to May 20, and so, uh, and I'll show you uh, data up to June 4 as well. So my talk is very much focused on data as opposed to, and I apologize if that was not the goal of this symposium, but I have been a, really a data addict for the last three uh, months. And so um, you can see that if for India, it keeps growing. So it has not turned the corner yet. So what has the lockdown done for us? Um, so, in terms of models, like, you know, when you think about model, and I want to uh, compliment you on your model and the daily projections, and I think it's incredibly important uh, to come up with updating the models daily because the reality on the ground are changing every day. Uh, so there are many, many models. The models have been growing exponentially as well as the pandemic. So um, how, what, and what do the models can do for us? So the models, when we did the forecasting exercise, we really did not know, right, before the lockdown that how is uh, the population going to behave? Well, how much will the basic reproduction number or the effective reproduction number, uh, the average number of people that a single infected person uh, infects, um, how, how would that look like? So it was all conjectural, right? So people came up with these curves uh, saying that if you actually are very cautious after the lockdown, this is what is going to happen. And those are the hypothesized on certain values of the model parameters. So I think it's very important to understand these big complex epidemiologic models are relying and are wrinkled with many, many assumptions. And so that's why they need to be revised uh, on a very frequent basis. Uh, so then we have certain assumptions. So this is a graph from our Harvard Data Science Review paper that talking about how do you do forecasting and thinking about uh, conjectural scenarios, hypothetical scenarios, if people behave with that cautiously, uh, they engage in a moderate way, but if they go back to being as usual, then you can lose quickly the effect of the lockdown as well. So, um, and this is an incidence graph and then there is, a, then there is another um, uh, 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 cumulative graph as well. So, um, you know, so, and then we also talked about um, the duration of lockdown. What is an optimal duration of lockdown? So we compared in that paper how to study the duration and the length of lockdown in terms of uh, projected case counts. And we saw that uh, definitely if you had to do a lockdown 
a two month window was a much better window than a one month window. And again, we already know this is almost trivial that if you keep extending lockdown, then the number of cases will probably go down, uh, but, um, or the disease spread is at least going to slow down, but that is that an effective strategy. These are mathematical models, but we need to do some visioning from this numerical forecasting. So uh, as I said that our app, I strongly, uh, you know, um, uh, pull a plug for like, you know, uh, really put in a plug for this uh, app because um, I think that we have built, um, spent incredible amount of energy so that the models get updated for every state every day. And it is a humongous computational thing because we run massive Bayesian models, uh, but uh, the university was generous enough to provide us free computing. Uh, so as we are talking about data, I think we need to talk about data resources as well. Uh, so where is India now? So this is the past, what happened. So before lockdown, lockdown 1.0, 2.0, uh, this is what we did. Where is India now? So I really want to uh, sort of give a snapshot. So, uh, um, this is, we have not seen turning around of the uh, curve. We are seeing increasing number of cases. And so this is a summary, and this has been mentioned many times about the case fatality rate, that the denominator problem, if you actually calculate it based on closed cases, where you know the outcome, it's actually much higher. Uh, we have a new paper where we compare, um, it's on MedArchive, where we compare different metrics, like what are the metrics for assessment across the different states. So um, this is India compared to other South Asian countries in terms of, again, the cumulative number of uh, reported deaths. So these are raw numbers. But if we look at India, if we do not recognize the need for modeling at a granular level, at a state level, even at a district level, I think we'll be not doing full justice to the problem. So I feel actually guilty that I did not realize this point that how important the statewide variations were in terms of policies and in terms of case counts. And I want to really show you five states, uh, four states and the national data to understand what is happening here and also the fact that we cannot really uh, breathe a sigh and um, say that declare victory because the virus, we have to respect the virus. You can see that in Kerala, in Punjab, where we saw initial progress, there are again more cases. And again, if we have a containment strategy and a surveillance strategy, we are going to be okay. But uh, we cannot let put our guards down in terms of the public health system. So. Uh, India, so most of India's cases come from five uh, states uh, so far. And so the pattern of India looks much more like what we see in Maharashtra, Delhi, Gujarat, Rajasthan, Tamil Nadu. And, uh, but there are states where things have been really, have, have done a phenomenal job in containing the pandemic. And uh, I was actually reaching out to the government of Punjab uh, about their strategies, what uh, it seems to have been very effective as well. Um, I want to show you some metrics, right? So after you get the data, imperfect data, but can we look at metrics to understand what has the lockdown done for us, if anything, uh, beyond increasing our miseries of with our daily lives and uh, um, socially marginalized groups. So um, now we look at, so this is different lockdown periods, and this is a metric of the effective R. And we can see that it has definitely gone down and we can talk about why this uh, spike is before the lockdown. So this is when the initial lockdown 1.0 was announced and then st steadily these have gone down. I'd really like to underscore that R and doubling time, these are more robust to actually data quality because they are ratio type measures which remain uh, less affected. And we have done a lot of simulation work to study this effect of underreporting on the uh, effective reproduction number. And so this is the R and these are the statewide Rs and our target goal is to get R below unity. And in India, it's right about like 1.25, 1.26. And, but then there are states where it, this, uh, this is not the, the metric and the benchmark has not been met. So, um, and then we look at like, you know, yesterday I ran the model again in preparation for this talk. And this is what we see that R seems to have plateaued and continuously around 1.3 uh, across the lockdown period. So, uh, and, and, and I'm, I'm very open to talking more about this, why I think that this is happening. Um, 
let us look at other metrics, right? So we need policymakers cannot digest all the data that we are seeing. We have to come up with sort of a summary. And this has been quoted a lot, uh, doubling time for the cumulative number of cases and the doubling time for the cumulative number of deaths. And uh, doubling time increasing is a good thing. And it has constantly been increasing. Uh, start of the uh, lockdown, it was about four days and it has become um, about 15 days now. So you can see the last seven day average of doubling time is about 15 days. Uh, so we can see that yes, in terms of this growth of the virus metric, the lockdown has been effective though the absolute number of cases have not gone down. So uh, then uh, I think like, you know, it's important to create dashboards where we can really look at the states overall. So this is something that my um, uh, research assistant, Maxwell Salvatore came up with, is that really create a forest plot, which is a common technique for doing uh, analysis across many states and many countries and many cohorts uh, to really come up with the ranking of the states in terms of different metrics and have a one-stop shop. So I want to share with you, this is on May 19th. So this is this dashboard also gets updated every uh, day based on the last seven day performance of the states. And so at the time we saw in May 19 that it seems like there was a spike in terms of the cases and the cases were moving and uh, Kerala had a bump. And then uh, due to the movement of the migrant workers, we saw some sp uh, spike in the Eastern states as well. So this was May 19. And so um, this red means like you are, uh, you should be watched out for and green means you are safe for the time being. And so we looked at R and we looked at uh, doubling time and we came up with sort of a summary metric I think which is very useful uh, for people to make guide decisions and think about uh, what is really going on. So let us look at Punjab. Why I was very intrigued by Punjab. So this is May 19th and this is uh, Punjab. It seems like they had an initial spike and the R was well below point uh, below one for a long time. And then I looked at the data yesterday. So uh, and so this is Punjab yesterday. So I think that, and if you, so in the dashboard, if you notice that Punjab was like, you know, had the, uh, have very good performances in terms on May 19th. And then you start seeing that there are some cases. And again, that's the point that if we have small number of cases that's going to happen after you exit, but you have to have a strategy to contain them. Uh, and then I, I looked at the dashboard yesterday, the same metrics, May 19th, two weeks later, and the ranking of the states keep changing. And so I think that it is important to really look at this because there are, if you, if there is, these are sensitive metrics um, and they are relative metrics. They're not giving you absolute case counts, but they are telling you that if there is a bump or not in the recent case counts. Uh, so uh, I, I personally like these types of visualization tools readily being available to decision makers. And I consider that as data scientists, it's our responsibility to make our work more translatable and accessible as well. Um, and these are recent performances. This is not over the whole time because as I'm looking at the dashboard, it's last seven days, what's going on. Um, I have not talked about test positive rate because most of my analytical work in terms of the mathematical treatment of the problem has been on testing. So it's surprising that I did not talk about it, but um, I, because it is such a complex problem that I think 25 minutes, I cannot do justice to it. Uh, but definitely the India is puzzling because test positive rates have been staying around 4% and 5%. And that has been argued that there has not been any community transmission or widespread. But I actually want to again show you that the variation across the states are undeniable and things which are you see an increasing trend in many, many states. And uh, I think it's very important to really monitor the, these trends at a granular level as we think about the future. <clears throat> so uh, ultimately the product, uh, as I said, you can download this graph every day. Um, and and you, you, so I, I, I want to look at this last seven days performance in terms of various metrics, uh, not just the slowing down, test positive rate, uh, case fatality rate, uh, reproduction number, as well as the doubling time. So there are many other metrics that you can think about. So uh, I did not think about statistics and modeling this way, honestly, before working on this problem, because it became, I, I, I basically worked through equations. And I have learned that in order to communicate, I just cannot work through equations. So this has been a great learning journey. 
So finally, prediction slides, right? So uh, last, uh, I think May 24, there was a Reuters article about our model uh, predicting um, uh, 5 lakhs to uh, 21 lakhs of cases uh, by July 1. And uh, this is true, but the model is predicting that. Uh, and if you go to the app, you can check because these predictions vary. What I really want to say is that look at this large uncertainty and the confidence interval in these projections. So then people will criticize that this is why we don't believe statisticians. You tell us nothing, 35 to 60,000, what does that tell us? So should we just stop this modeling exercise? And should we really focus on not these numbers, but what the models tell us? So that's a question I want to pose to the audience that what are these models and what are they giving us? Uh, what data do we need? I really want death data and other disease admissions data. So this is an example of a dashboard uh, from, uh, from US where uh, there's a historic line and this line, just think about this, this line could be an average of daily deaths. It could be a daily illness due to sorry or ILI. Uh, but then I am tracking that and as soon as the line, the observed line, so this is the orange line, is departing from the historical average, then I'm on high alert because there may be an outbreak, outbreak threshold. And I want, I want this at a granular level. And then once we do interventions, actually, that as we heard, that the death due to accidents, death due to other infectious diseases, diarrhea, they go down. And that's why, and, and influenza and other sin, uh, infectious diseases also go down. So it falls below the average line because you have introduced this social distancing and intervention and hand hygiene. So mobility data and uh, this type of, so that I can compare with the historic average is very important. This is a temperature map. Uh, if there is an easy app uh, collecting temperature, how can you predict what are the emerging outbreak and hotspots? So uh, these are some of the things I think is uh, easily, not easily, but I think it's still um, doable in terms of uh, sharing and disseminating the data. Um, I want to think about a little bit, like the last few minutes I have, I know that I probably exceeded time and I apologize, uh, is that moving forward. So lockdown is not a sustainable long-term strategy because it has a cost uh, to daily lives. And I want to say that as we move forward, the public has a serious role in public health. If you want to roll out policies where there is no community participation and buy-in and the public has not understood why you are doing this, I think that's going to be very risky. And we also need to understand and be cognizant that there has been a paradigm shift in our daily living. Uh, we need to manage risk. If you think about, we actually live with a lot of risk in our daily lives. How can we still continue to live uh, knowing that a large number of us are going to probably be infected and we are going to be okay. Many of us are going, not even going to be understanding that we had the disease if we don't get tested, uh, that's, that's problematic. But how can we really risk stratify? Who is at high risk and who should be protected? Uh, the data, I think it's very important to track the data uh, every day and uh, I think policymakers at every level is doing that, but we cannot be complacent and you have to watch out. As long as there are a few cases in the community, you have to nip it in the bud. Um, it's very hard for policymaking, right? It takes years to roll out a policy and you're now telling me that I need to roll out policies every three days and change it. Uh, but we have to really get used to this pause, push and drive mode of living, learning and leading uh, and teaching in a data adaptive way as well. Uh, and I think that data can be used also to deploy resources. So if you can predict that the next peak is going to be in Haryana, you can move resources from Punjab uh, in order to help that so process. So I think that it's very important to estimate how many beds, how many uh, PPE uh, ventilators and, uh, will be needed and where as there are these cascades of hotspots and the cascades of peaks are coming through. So. Um, I, I want to digress a little bit because I also am a human being. I, I, I want to, so this is not about public health. 
And I think it's a, it has been a tale of two disciplines. And uh, I think the conversation that pitting public health against economics has been uh, very politicized. And uh, I think it's a misplaced because you really have to work together uh, because you're trying to minimize the total number of lives and livelihoods. And so um, like, you know, the lives lost and, you know, so you really have to focus on the whole human flourishing, the concept of human flourishing. I really enjoyed this article. This came out in Nature Cancer, uh, which is about uh, on being a human in the time of, a, uh, in the face of a pan pandemic. And I think it's very important to lead with efficiency, uh, empathy, as well as elasticity, because you are going to have to uh, escalate policies which are working and shut down policies which seem to be not effective. Um, I want to underscore one point. There has been tremendous differences across the world in terms of the success and treatment of this pandemic. But one thing is very common, that the loss of distribution of loss is not equal. So we really need to think about from Dharavi, Mumbai to Detroit, Michigan, and I'm going to show you this data that I have been, really have not slept for the last few days to analyze the data from Michigan Medicine. And this is a data comparing lives loss in uh, non-Hispanic Blacks and non-Hispanic Whites. And you can see that um, there has been a tremendous inequity. And this epidemic has really underscored that the difference and the divide between the haves and have nots of this world. And together as a society, if we do not work on this, then I don't think that I qualify as a data scientist because this is the problem. I just cannot work on my models. In my own state, West Bengal, uh, on top of everything, there was Cyclone Amphan. So how do you do uh, social distancing when a natural disaster hits? You have to live first. So I think that it is a very challenging time for the world. I feel the Darwinian theory of natural selection and survival of the fittest is truly, truly being tested. I, at some point of time, when you feel a crisis in life, uh, my father is an actor and I grew up in a home of liberal arts. Science does not do it for me. So I want to quote and end on a note of hope because we are, I know that we have all gone through so much stress uh, by an, Austri an Austrian poet, Arilka that which really resonated with me that let everything happen to you, the beauty and the terror, just keep going. No feeling is final. So in life, you know, things move cyclically. And when we are very happy, we know that sadness around is around the corner. When we are sad, we know there is light at the end of the day. I want to, I, I drew a lot of inspiration from this picture. This man uh, during cyclone, uh, is really walking, walking alone, but there's tremendous strength in the footstep that he is taking. So with, on that note, I want to thank you all for your attention and please stay safe. Thank you very much. So unfortunately we have uh, run out of time. So we'll come back to discussion at the end. Uh, and thanks for a very poignant note at the end. So we'll move to Giridhar's presentation. So uh, you can start. Hello, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Oh, wonderful. So good evening, everyone. Good morning, uh, Dr. Brahma and everyone in US. And uh, let me start in uh, the title of the topic is data in the time of COVID-19 pandemic. What do we have and what do we need? And I would want to start with this. Uh, when we look at uh, the kind of uh, situation we are in, uh, especially as an epidemiologist, uh, also as a public health uh, practitioner throughout my life, I've seen people are picking on to different aspects of the entire COVID-19 pandemic. And for each one of us, the entire universe is within that. So if somebody is only uh, focusing on modeling, let's say uh, on uh, holding onto the tail and then somebody else says, no, no, you're wrong. Uh, what you are seeing is different and I'm looking at migrant labors. I have been uh, challenged with uh, 
this kind of perceptions in every go so therefore when i say data what is that we are using it for what is the ultimate goal and how do we go about it uh, so as an epidemiologist where do i start so let me start from where i can find the data so if you just do google scholar search you will find 48100 uh, results uh, since uh, the beginning of 2020 for just the keyword covid-19 uh, on top of that, if this is just the quantity, uh, you look at what happened to the HCQ study uh, reported in the Lancet, and uh, uh, the same uh, set of authors had to retract from uh, two leading journals with highest impact factor. So what do you then trust? Uh, you'll have to begin with where, whatever you have in terms of uh, the data that is available in the country. So where is the data in India? How do we assess it? And uh, what about the quantity, which source of data I need to look at, whether I can trust it or not. Generally, it is said, uh, uh, and Dr. Sundar Raman sir made a wonderful presentation in terms of uh, what are the different sources of data. I'm only focusing on COVID-19 and then uh, explaining in terms of what we can trust and how we can go forward. So if just availability is an issue, uh, whether there is transparency in sharing the data uh, is another issue and whether there is uh, confidentiality and protection of the data that is already available at different sources. So these are the different set of uh, data available. I'll explain this when I'm uh, giving some analysis using this. And uh, Dr. Brahma explained uh, in terms of uh, the modeling that she has done and uh, especially around the reproductive number. But what we don't have are uh, many data variables. Uh, these are just few. And I'll explain why these are important uh, and what is the necessity of having it. So if I look at these two set of things, what we do not have, and look at the age distribution uh, and also in terms of what is the exact clinical presentation, and also beyond COVID, uh, do I have uh, information on SARI, ILI, whether somebody is symptomatic or not? What is the severity of symptoms? Then I'll have to find different partners or collaborators. So if I need anything related to the lab, I'll have to go to Indian Council of Medical Research. If I have to go uh, find out who are the primary contacts, who are the secondary contacts, what is the hospitalization, what is the severity? What about death? I need to go to either the states that I want to work with or IDSP as well explained by Dr. Sundar Raman sir. Sometimes even states don't have it because I'm working with several states now. Some states do not have the details or even the line list maintained for uh, several cases. So as an epidemiologist, the first thing you would want to see is how the infections are occurring in the community. And then if the two smaller teapots keep adding this infection to the prevalent pool, you also have the exit route in terms of what proportion of them are getting cured and what proportion of them are uh, succumbing to mortality. So this is the basic uh, model. It's not a mathematical model, but the minimum thing that one has to understand. But in order to do that, what do I have in terms of the actual number of people who are infected in the community, we don't know. We, do, we really do not know what, because you don't know what is the proportion of the people who are infected in the community, you also don't know how you're going to monitor them over a period of time in terms of disease progression, what proportion of them are getting cured and what is the actual mortality rate. And even when it is available, it is just a fraction of the people who are being picked up by the health system on whom all the analysis is being done. So if this is just the uh, uh, model in terms of COVID-19, uh, it becomes complicated if you want to look at any other data sources. For anything that you want to do, you will have to go and find out multiple programs uh, to get data for anything related to uh, national health indicators. So uh, 
these are the different surveillance programs that I've listed. Uh, and then uh, if you can see that if you want to get an integrated data in terms of what's happening in the country, then you need to be talking to so many different vertical program heads and their program to get the data. So therefore, surveillance is the most important thing as Dr. Sundar Raman said. Well, however, the way we need to collect the data from these programs is very complicated. So therefore, uh, as, as much as it is important, uh, uh, it is also complicated. We have not made any efforts to integrate. So if this is the problem at the India's level, let's look at what's happening with the global level. So this is the Global Health Security Index score and uh, the higher the score, the better is the preparedness. But here is the problem. Uh, if you were to uh, distribute uh, in terms of how well the countries are prepared in terms of Global Health Security Index, and you also look at how uh, they are managing the COVID-19 uh, index, there are countries like UK, United States, Sweden, France, which have really high score in global health security index, but they also are the poorest performers when it comes to COVID-19. So can global health security index give you a reliable indication that the countries have prepared well? Probably not. And uh, so then what should you be prepared for? So whatever the data that is already available, I feel, is heavily resource uh, centered and therefore the developed countries rank better. But during pandemics, you will come to know uh, actually what the robustness of the public health system is, especially the public health surveillance part of it. So if that's uh, regarding the general architecture, uh, what is the new understanding of the disease uh, and how we are going to assess that in India? Uh, this is uh, the recent, as of yesterday, uh, the results presented by Zero Prevalence Service in the United Kingdom. And then if you would see the national uh, standardized prevalence is around 8.5% uh, based on the zero prevalence studies done in the United Kingdom. So, but the overall, uh, the number of deaths and the number of cases are going down uh, in the entire uh, country. So we are nowhere near whatever the proportion, because there has been so much discussion around herd immunity, people said 60%, then they said, no, 60% is not ideal, maybe 40, maybe 30. Uh, let's forget all those numbers. If at 10%, the total, I mean, let's say take 8.5 8 as 10. If at 10% zero prevalence, the number of cases are going down, the number of deaths are going down. Have we understood this disease completely? Uh, is it, uh, that the virus is adapting faster or is it just some are more vulnerable than the others in terms of getting the infection and then get succumbed to the complications of it. UK is not alone. You look at Europe uh, and this is from the Washington Post today, uh, which explains uh, after the lockdown is lifted, all the countries are seeing decrease in number of cases and deaths. And there has not been a further increase uh, in these countries, whether it's Italy, Germany, Belgium, or Netherlands. So this, uh, how do we explain in terms of what proportion of people are going to get affected in uh, India, in terms of what number of uh, hospital beds and ICU beds that I, uh, we need to uh, probably uh, working with the systems to prepare. If that uh, alone is not the problem, uh, there comes symptomatic versus asymptomatic. And what is their role in terms of spreading the disease? As of yesterday evening, it was only symptomatics uh, who are known to spread the infection. Uh, thanks to this wonderful review uh, uh, by Eric Topol and colleagues, they show that uh, only, although a small fraction, fraction of asymptomatic people may eventually develop the symptoms, but asymptomatic people can continue spreading uh, the virus to others, possibly longer than 14 days. So this will then change everything that uh, we want to know in terms of uh, how the clusters have developed of asymptomatic people, what proportion of them exist in our community, how are they uh, transmitting the uh, disease. If this is the US uh, indicators based on the CDC, uh, if you would see for six weeks in a row, 
they showed that the percentage of deaths uh, due to pneumonia, influenza, and COVID-19 are decreasing. Yet, uh, the percentage uh, remains above the epidemic threshold of 6.3%. Uh, so what is, uh, this indicates? A country with a robust surveillance estimates uh, can actually predict in terms of uh, whatever threshold is beyond that, uh, what is the actual burden. But given the burden that we have, has the country done enough? That's entirely a different uh, question, which uh, is beyond uh, at least my scope of uh, epidemiological assessment. And also these are the figures from uh, US uh, CDC. And you would see that uh, the number of uh, beds required would increase with uh, the age. And therefore, this is a very important indicator, uh, especially in India, as we are lifting the lockdown in terms of what is the proportion of elderly requiring the beds? Do we have these estimates? Uh, that's the kind of question. So what we don't know in India is what is the virus uh, shedding in terms of asymptomatic people? No studies uh, done systematically. And uh, we have not, uh, although we are discussing about or not, we have not discussed anything about clusters. If you see in India, most uh, cases, nearly uh, more than 50 to 60% uh, could be attributed to clusters, which included uh, the Nandit pilgrimage, Chennai market, Mumbai slums, and the Nizamuddin uh, events. And yet, we do not have any estimates of uh, what kind of uh, clusters uh, are being developed, what is the dispersion in the how do we account this as we move forward uh, when we are lifting the lockdown? What proportion of people can uh, again get reinfected with uh, uh, the COVID-19? Uh, so this is also not clearly known. But what do we know? Uh, we know that the test that we have, which we use for diagnosis is not completely accurate and our case count might be wrong. So uh, this we know, but uh, I want to draw your attention to what Japan did and instead of doing prospective contact tracing, they showed that retrospective tracing. So when you find a case, you go back and find out their complete history and then find out whether they've developed symptoms or not. So that has been phenomenal in terms of uh, finding and uh, stopping the transmission in the early period. <coughs> Further, they also showed that following 3C approach, uh, which is, uh, in terms of preventing the close spaces uh, uh, congestion and managing the crowded places and close contact settings, even without a lockdown, Japan showed the world that uh, you can manage. That means we need to manage the clusters. We need to manage uh, you know, overcrowding uh, in Indian settings uh, since the lockdown is being lifted. I've been written much about it. We are opening up the religious places first, uh, which are... Uh, probably visited mostly by the elderly and the high risk people who are immunocompromised. They are, uh, these places are crowded and also there is a lot of close contact there. So if one person coughs, uh, then there is droplet transmission to all the people present there. Generally our, our religious places um, house people for very long time. So what are we doing as we are lifting the lockdown is we need to do. The next thing I would want to uh, show is in terms of indicators before I conclude. So this is cases per million state-wise. You would see that uh, at least the top five states are Delhi, Maharashtra, Tamil Nadu, Gujarat, and um, uh, Jammu and Kashmir. Then if you would want to look at test positivity, uh, again, Maharashtra, Telangana, Delhi, and Gujarat. So you would see that cases and tests uh, are not the same, which means there's a lot of things happening around who is getting tested, why they're getting tested. I wouldn't want to go into the details. If that's uh, just the uh, index of what kind of data we have, once you start counting the dead in each state, uh, things change. So look at case fatality. Uh, Gujarat has the highest, 6.2, followed by West Bengal, Madhya Pradesh, and Maharashtra, Telangana, so on and so forth. But uh, I agree with all the other presenters, that's not a good indicator. So if you look at death per million, Delhi has the highest uh, in terms of 35 death per million, followed by 23 in Maharashtra, Gujarat uh, next uh, with 17, then Madhya Pradesh and Chandigarh, West Bengal. So we wanted to understand uh, 
what is the relation between who is getting tested and what kind of uh, uh, fatality that the states are seeing. So uh, this is big dated because in uh, COVID things change from day to day, as you saw from Dr. Mukherjee's uh, presentation. Uh, but we found that the tests uh, which are done uh, better and also the fatality being uh, low uh, will have lower test positivity and they'll also have lower case fatality and therefore you see left lower quadrant where most uh, states are uh, uh, concentrated. On the other hand, on the right, uh, 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 on the top right, you will see Madhya Pradesh, Gujarat, West Bengal, and Maharashtra, which have higher test positivity and also have high case fatality, although the number of tests done per million is poorer, at least in West Bengal, Gujarat. And when you look at this, uh, you get a different feeling. Uh, you know, when you have background prevalence high, then even if you do it randomly, your test positivity will be higher. And uh, these are the states which also have higher fatalities. So therefore, uh, this is very useful. I, I agree with uh, uh, Dr. Brahma that whatever data is available to you, we should be using it and then trying to make meaningful inferences and we should be helping the states and the, uh, uh, whoever is seeking advice, whether it's national government or state government, in terms of how to resolve these issues. There are other indicators for estimating death and there are advantages and limitations. I wouldn't want to go into the details, but then uh, because it is not uh, easily made uh, available. And also, as I said, uh, the complexities in terms of getting the data from different sources uh, one wouldn't be able to uh, estimate uh, a, a more reliable indicators. At the same time, whatever is available to us, we have done uh, some analysis and showed that uh, we can definitely uh, contribute. So uh, before I conclude, I would want to uh, just discuss uh, the last bit about cluster approach and which is not discussed much uh, in the national settings. So when uh, the first case came and also much before the lockdown, uh, Bangalore did retrospective tracing. And we see the results in terms of how many cases are in Bangalore compared to the other places. Uh, where more than 50% of the cases and deaths are in metros, Bangalore model has been uh, recently coming in. I'm, I don't want to get into who is better or not. The point I'm saying here is public health surveillance, public health strengthening is the only way forward. Uh, we are getting lost, uh, we are getting confused between testing rates and kind of facilities that we have, which hospital is designated for COVID and not. So there's so much of noise, but one thing which is, which is standing out is if you build robust public health systems with strong public health surveillance, we should be able to predict, prevent and protect uh, our people in terms of any pandemic, not just COVID-19. With that, I'll conclude and thank you for this wonderful opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Giridhar. So maybe we will just move on to the discussion. Uh, I request uh, Ramanujam to take over and start the process of discussions. Yeah, uh, thanks very much, Pinaki. Uh, when we start the discussion, I want to introduce uh, the initiator of the discussion. This is Dr. Girija Vaidyanathan. She was former chief secretary of government of Tamil Nadu. She has a doctorate in health economics and uh, was health secretary and uh, director of, uh, I'm secretary of the family and health welfare division of the government of Tamil Nadu, mission director of national rural health mission, a person with deep understanding of the health sector and also government and uh, the complexities of many of the things that we are talking about. It's a great pleasure to have uh, Dr. Girija Vaidyanathan with us, and uh, I request her to start the discussion off. Uh, thank you all. Uh, I think I must uh, confess, as, uh, as I am here as a layman, I'm definitely not here as a civil servant. Uh, if anything, after having retired, which I did last year, I, I have joined uh, the, what, uh, or attempting to become more of a thinker rather than somebody who has to apologize for all the sins of civil servants as uh, as I have been used to doing for 38 years. The other thing is, it was four stellar lectures. I had apologized to uh, Ramanujam before saying I have a family situation on hand with three grandchildren, which I'm juggling. So I told him I might not sit through the lectures, but I actually managed 
not only manage i couldn't let go of all the lectures and i think whatever i heard has been if uh, i mean has set most of us know what was in these lectures but the way they were presented each one has given us an insight into what we are doing right now each each of the uh, persons who talked has uh, uh, has deeply understood the issues which he has talked about especially rakal and how data is how the questions regarding the pandemic need to be framed and sundar of course i mean uh, uh, there was a really brilliant lecture on uh, on um, uh, surveillance and how we do surveillance in the country and how we should be doing surveillance in the country of course professor brahma mokerji i was comp- i mean I, 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 hearing we've all been hearing about modeling we've been uh, all trying to understand bits of it but to see that such a large group of scientists uh, are trying to work on what's going on and how we can actually try to predict i mean what it says might be scary to some of us but i think it is the reality that we are seeing whatever be the other data that is talked about the reality is at least those of us let us say in tamil nadu are facing is yes, there is the the pandemic is all around us of course professor giridhar babu on what we have what we don't have and all the lectures a good part of it is that they all struck positive notes on the fact that uh we do need to move forward we we cannot keep complaining that the system is is faulty i don't think we have ever faced and so i think uh, prasam mukherjee called it a tidal wave we can call it a tsunami we can call it any number of things i don't think in our living memory we have faced uh, my generation which is the 60 year olds of today have not faced a crisis uh, a public health crisis of this enormity world over and so for me the, all the four lectures have uh, have been extremely illuminating set me thinking and i think as sundar and i sitting in tamil nadu have been sharing uh, keeps telling us that we keep need to keep uh, on our feet and see what we can do to influence people to look at the data better and use it for better management now right now i know many of you are eager i've been watching the chats everyone is eager to start the discussions so i will keep to my uh, role as initiator and hope that the discussions are as uh, as interesting and as useful and as productive as the lectures that have gone before thank you very much and uh, here's the floor to whoever is moderating thank you very much uh, pinak will you take over for the questions i'll do so uh, so maybe uh, if uh, first i would like to request the panelists themselves to have um, some opening thoughts on uh, the discussion on I mean, the different presentations that you heard and do want to share some thoughts on that Can I start? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so uh, I just want to add um, um, to both what Dr. Uh, Rakul and Dr. Sundar Raman sir uh, explained so well. Uh, a lot has been discussed in terms of whether lockdown was necessary or not, whether we have really achieved the goal or not. But I think, uh, as public health community or uh, all the relevant sto- stakeholders together. Uh, we need to figure out what are the constructive suggestions and what is the actual framing that we need to do right now as we move forward and one thing i would want to ask sundar raman sir to mo- explain uh, much better because he was at the uh, helm of the affairs uh, advising the union government for a long time uh, uh, why were the integration of surveillance programs uh, uh, weren't that successful because now we have multiple vertical programs Uh, as in uh, as we move forward there are more and more uh, uh, vertical programs being added so you're muted sir uh, you need to unmute please there are these are two different issues one is the issue of why is that data flow from these different programs not integrated and another is why the programs are not integrated both of these uh, uh there is a strong overlap obviously if uh, programs don't want to be integrated they are not very likely to let their data be integrated but there is this whole issue of the integrated disease surveillance program and its interfaces with the other programs so uh, we discussed this issue in the context of uh, interoperability challenges on this in fact i have a book on the whole topic so i can't summarize it very easily but uh, uh, 
there are problems at the level of how uh, institutions function, how they achieve, there are priorities, how they are set. And I, I mean, in fact, I'm not going to venture a quick answer to why things don't happen on this particular. We know that they don't happen. The problem about uh, the IDSP data is a different problem. You see, the IDSP, in a lot of this data, in fact, my students, when I was in teaching in Data Institute of Social Sciences, I had an internship for them, where my main function was to actually take them into, uh, uh, take them into uh, this, uh, take them into, uh, uh, leave them in a district, ask them to collect all the data that is available and draw up a profile. They would start by saying, oh, the data is very poor quality. We can't do anything. We can't, the IDSP data isn't there. Then I would ask them to read that data. It took a long time actually and visiting on the field to help them read that data. And then they found actually that there is a lot of things that could be done with the data. So the problem at one level is interpretation and use of data. If you don't interpret and use data, then the data quality does not improve. And if you don't uh, improve data quality, that becomes a justification. So it sort of becomes a vicious cycle. My sense is that across programs, there is this thing of uh, underestimating uh, uh, how much we can do with data and sort of dismissing the data that we have or building data systems that are robust. And therefore, we settle for very ad hoc systems that are limited to one program. So now we have a COVID-19. People, what are they going to Today, every district collector is interested, but soon they will have other programs. Who is going to manage this? Where will be the flow of information if it is not integrated? So I think that at some point, this sort of knee-jerk sort of responses where some owner of a program which has gained priority assumes that that is what matters and all the rest of them, they start ignoring is a problem. In fact, data flow in some of the other programs has stopped recently, has slowed down, stopped, got interrupted across the whole programs. So a system that has taken 15 years to set up has got disrupted many programs by the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And this is really what we should not have allowed to happen on that. Or it's sad on that term. So we have COVID-19 numerators on flow. But we don't have the whole rest of the data that we have, or at least it's been compromised. So there's a related question. Uh, Gautam has asked you, why did the IDSP NCDC stop releasing the flu surveillance data? So it's, I think at some point that knowledge is a bit of power over here. Okay. And we had constructed a narrative. There is a mega, what we can call a meta narrative, which is the prime minister, Amit Shah, the political government, and everybody was, all the media was in praise of how an early, that our government had been earlier than everybody else. Never mind that Belgium also did it and had a greater mortality also, but whatever, there was a narrative constructed. And that narrative had certain requirements. And at some point, there was a need to keep the data in conformity with the requirements, which is not the same as, I mean, at one larger level, it is uh, a data manipulation, but at, at, at the local level, it's not that. It's the way in which you, you build the systems that generate what you want to generate. So you don't look at certain things, you look at certain things, you build your protocols this way, that way. Within this meta narrative, you had one narrative that the, for a long time, the IDSP, which should have been the persons who were announcing the data, were not to be seen. It was ICMR and its leadership that was, because they know the viral laboratories and can say test. They can't really comment on an epidemic. That took one month before it changed. So between them, they had developed a certain narratives. And then we developed this whole thing about India having the lowest case fatality rate, which as is very clearly a matter of wrong calculation of that at some point, even now that calculation persists. And within that, Tamil Nadu would excel by adding other factors. So we build these narratives and then somewhere the interpretation of data seems to be required to support these narratives on that. And I think that's been part of the problem on this. But I had one question to Ms. Mukherjee also, Dr. Mukherjee. Uh, 
uh, that she was, I was noticing in her slides that Kerala was coming up uh, as the uh, lowest performer in uh, many of the indicators and also Orissa in many ways, whereas in a commonsensical way, we would consider its performance, and not only common sense, in many other ways, far higher. So whereas Maharashtra, the top five states, were in some level the, the places with the lowest uh, uh, RO and the highest doubling rates were Maharashtra, Delhi, Gujarat, those places. Whereas Kerala and this, which have almost no pandemic uh, uh, presence, it's a trickle which is well controlled, managed. We have reached uh, endemicity as we can know it, was actually being present even then, even on the dates that she presented, was showing much higher over here. So Kerala is been remarkable in the level in which it has actually been able to, it's the only state that has contained the epidemic. Containment as if it was, the, all the rest have only reached a mitigation level. But her figures didn't reflect it and I was wondering what was in her method that led to that sort of a difference on that. A similar thing to Orissa, but Orissa, the pandemic has not yet arrived. Kerala, on the other hand, was first, and for a time, number of time, it was the leading state, and it was higher than Tamil Nadu and Maharashtra. Now, Tamil Nadu and Maharashtra are way ahead, and Kerala is way down, but not by the indicators that you have deployed. And that's what is for me the problem about the way indicators are uh, constructed. So I see that. So yeah. I think uh, yeah, I'd love to uh, thank you for that question. And that's a very pertinent question because uh, I was very surprised because in all my previous work, I actually have uh, written that Kerala is the role model and the historic tenets and the control uh, is exemplary to the whole world. And I was very surprised when the seven day metrics uh, in Kerala did not look that great in terms of R and doubling time. So I think I'd like to really qualify that doubling time and R not, these are relative metrics as we know that if we go from a small number of cases, uh, it's easy to have a bump, right? So in the last, so what happened, I looked at the data and I think it was in my plots as well, that Kerala, though the number of cases were small, but it was again having a small bump. So I think in terms of watching out, you have to take the whole thing into perspective in terms of the absolute number of cases. It's very easy to go, like, you know, have one event and go from 10 cases to 20 cases. So it's easy to change R or the relative numbers in a short time span. So I was watching out. So we have in our app long-term averages, which actually talks about the entire course. And I think in terms of case fatality rates, in terms of test positive rates, uh, and then we had seven day averages to watch out that if is actually you see an increase in terms of cases, things which you are plateauing, but you suddenly see that, and you see that even with a small number of cases, you see an increase in the trend. So it was actually really talking about the second peak and those relative measures is very important to, for us to understand what each of the metrics actually give us. If you look so, at the entire time period, the classification will be very different. So if I may come in, I have had this worry about doubling time because yeah. if you have two lakh cases or now uh, they are close to one lakh, to say that they are going to have another one lakh within, uh, uh, it will take them 10 days. Whereas Kerala can go from 50 cases to 100 cases in one day. And then you can say they have a doubling time of one day and this is a 20 days. I think there is a problem not only about numbers, it's about double. So when we looked at different indicators, I started using the number of days it takes to reach an additional 10,000 cases because that had an immediate implication for planning the number of beds I need, for the planning of ventilators I need. Whereas this particular thing was not able to give me the, uh, for my planning thing. So I'm a bit worried about the way that indicator behaves. And Tamil Nadu, for example, uh, you are having, if you say the number of days taken for the next 5,000 is dropped to three days, from about 15 days. But if you take doubling time, doubling time has actually increased. How does it matter? Because at some point, the number of extra beds I have to create is what drives me. And that is exactly why I think that that's a, you, are, you have a very strong point here. So along with the dashboard, I showed you the prediction models, right? That what is what you are predicting is the number absolute scale is very important, not the relative scale. The relative scale is very susceptible to this small, particularly with small numbers. Relative scale means nothing. 
So the absolute scale, that's why the forecasting models, even with their large uncertainties with worst case scenarios are helpful to policymakers because that can tell you that what should you be prepared for? If I am going to have in the worst case scenario, 500,000 cases at a state level, how many cases and what fraction of them can get admitted to the hospital? What fraction of them will need ICU beds? That's why I think the forecasting models has a different kind of utility. And looking at this doubling metric, relative metrics are very puzzling because they are so sensitive when particularly when you have small numbers, you have no sense, as you said, 10 to 20 is not the same from one lakh to two lakhs. And there is no sense in when you just look at that metric. And, but what it helps me in, a, in terms of the long-term averages, of course, I look at everything in totality, the forecasting models every day in terms of the number of cases that really matters. That's something that you can deal with. Uh, but the uh, doubling time and the R sort of over the last seven days gives you an inkling if there is a rate of growth so that you can actually really uh, increase your surveillance and alert your contact tracing. So that's all I think uh, I'm trying to say. So Pramod, there is a question from Gautam. Uh, so this is regarding the calculation of R. So there is a problem uh, when the incidence becomes zero. So how does one handle that? And we also, I mean, at uh, ISRC, we're also trying to compute R and we are facing this problem. Uh, so we're trying to yeah. use the Imperial College model, and maybe you can just comment slightly. Yeah, so I think that, you know, this is a great question. And uh, so with the APST model, of course, you have the problem when the number of cases go to zero. So what we have been using is actually, you know, all our models are um, Bayesian models. So you basically do something like a, a prior, which avoids just like if you think about statistically, if it's a zero cell frequency, if you have a prior, you basically are doing a continued uh, continuity correction like that. So, um, uh, so I think that that's something is um, the, that's something that we have done in order to do something like a continuity correction to make the uh, estimates more stable. Thank you. So maybe we can discuss this later on after the meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, so a couple of questions for Rahal. Uh, so yeah, yeah. Um, one is that uh, how do uh, modelers approach the government? So because government either takes the model with full spirit or it rejects uh, wholeheartedly because it doesn't match their expectations. And also how do scientists speak to the government? So what is the way, I mean, since you are at the interface, maybe you can uh, give us, share some yeah. thoughts, advice on yeah. this. Yeah. yeah, sure. Uh, thanks. Uh, and, and first of all, thanks for these wonderful talks uh, uh, by, by all my uh, the fellow panelists. It was really a great learning experience. Uh, and yes, I think, uh, I think uh, uh, the first thing that I think one learns very, very quickly when one starts interacting with, uh, you know, uh, uh, bureaucrats, with politicians, with, uh, you know, other uh, sort of uh, program managers, is that we are actually talking very, very, very different languages. And what we mean when we say something, even if we're using the same word, uh, actually is is like is like this is a whole 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 way of you know different. And 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 this sort of debate, I think, is so nicely brought out in uh, what uh, you know we 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 uh, how we interpret models. Uh, and and I find exactly as the you know question uh, is put that there are only two ways in which I have seen uh, bureaucrats uh, and politicians uh, you know deal with models. One is believe them 100% uh, or reject them 100%. Uh, and and when, when, you know, we try and say that, listen, the, mo the importance of the model is that it shows you how a system will behave. And the more you have different models showing you, you know, patterns and, and you know, let's look at the patterns. Let's look at what different models are saying uh, about a system, about how a system will work. Uh, and, and you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, but those things are, I think, extremely, you know, counterintuitive, uh, uh, or, or, or I don't know what counterintuitive, but at, at least doesn't, you know, get understood. And actually, if you dig deeper, I think because uh, that is, I think, because the way in which governments or bureaucracies frame problems, uh, there's a target, you reach a target, and that's defined as a success. Whereas I think in, in, in epidemics in public health, I mean, you know, it, it's, it's a moving target. I mean, you have to believe that these systems will evolve. There is an epicenter today, but that epicenter moves. And, and as, uh, you know, uh, uh, Dr. Mukherjee very rightly pointed out, uh, the curve for India 
is is actually really to me not a curve at all because it it actually consists of a curve in kerala which is very different from a curve in karnataka and a curve in punjab uh, yet you know uh, you you sort of lose that granularity when you start talking about doubling time in india uh, you know but and and same for you know kerala i mean you know the 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 curve or the understanding of say a northern kerala district like kasargod uh, and say a middle kerala district or or you know uh, something with a border of uh, in tamil nadu like palakkad is completely different uh, and i think you know that nuance that 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 level of granularity that uh, you know is, is is i think something i don't know and, and maybe girija ma'am can you know talk about that as a, as as a bureaucrat uh you know sometimes i think there there is that you know need to make a decision now is this correct is this wrong and they we, i think it's very difficult to deal with that uncertainty and i think that is i think a big challenge uh you know uh that we have uh you know when we are communicating and and what i i have tried to do wherever i've had this opportunity uh you know to communicate is to start by saying this is the question i am answering what is the question you want to be answered and 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 make sure that even if it's like uh, 10 minutes but to, to to hammer out the point that we are both talking about the same thing and i find that that somewhat helps then moving the conversation forward when both of us realize uh, you know that we are asking the same question so I, i and and this gets some of the bureaucrats irritated i mean i want to control the epidemic yes but what is the question you want to answer is it you know uh, is it how many people in a community have infection is it who is at high risk to have an infection is it where is the new epicenter of the epidemic and each of these are extremely different questions and have different data uh, you know uh, needs have very different information uh, you know and very different collection uh, you know on uh, strategies but the point is that okay we do a zero surveillance you get a number and immediately that's supposed to explain everything else and and i think that is really the the, the communication gap um, and and i remember i'll just end my just one thing uh, by saying that actually what kerala uh, what i have learned uh, you know uh, uh, interacting with this whole kerala uh, you know uh, um, bureaucracy is that there has been a huge amount of cross learning between public health uh, you know people between bureaucrats between politicians and and i think that uh, you know cross learning that has happened uh, uh, makes it i think somewhat more uh, easy to start asking these questions about assumptions about framing the question and so on and 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 then you know communicate uh, uh, you know more effectively so so what i'm trying to say is there is a historical process too it's not just that you know someone can just go into a government office and be communicate better or 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 worse it's this there is this history on which we are building um and i just want to underline one question on open data i think that is just such an important question that there is a demand that all data be made open and transparent and accessible uh and i think this comes again from the framing when you frame things as success uh, and failure then you want to protect and control data but when you see uh, the data as actually uh, you know a way of action a way of pointing to the right action then you are ready to sh- share it with as many people who can give the piece of it so yeah so these are just some of the points i thought i'd share at this point uh, thanks very much i mean really well enunciated both on the heterogeneity aspect of it and the data aspect of it and we at uh, isrc are pushing for this openness of data and trying to aggregate data also so hopefully we can uh, provide so contribute to that so one question to giridhar is uh, you've talked about the japan uh, experience so is it possible at all to replicate this in india or to what extent one can replicate this in india yeah <clears throat> i i get the uh... Uh, suspicion regarding whether we can manage uh, crowds in india but then we have done well in terms of managing uh, uh, reasonably well in terms of all the restrictions uh, through the lockdown so i feel as long as a policy is made uh, currently it's very troubling for me to see that uh, the religious places are the first ones to open up and when i see elderly and people with several diseases uh, staying in close spaces for more than half an hour whichever 
um, religious place you would want to mention, uh, that puts them at straight away at greater risk. And that's how uh, the Indian story has been so far in terms of spreading the numbers. So the prevention of clusters and managing the crowds, especially in the closed spaces, is very important. But is there a critical number which the government should announce? I think we need to take several considerations. It depends on the unit square area of closed space, whether people are using masks or not, how many people are there, and uh, all the other precautions that one has to take. So uh, I would say banning larger events in closed uh, spaces, at least for a few uh, weeks, uh, should at least, uh, not, not even, at least one incubation period, and then see uh, the data. Uh, looking at what's happening in Europe and UK, uh, what if the case numbers start coming down? And that has been very intriguing in terms of what proportion of population is required to get infected after which the infections uh, don't spread or the, is it the virus getting ad adapted or is it um, that's how the, uh, this pandemic is? We are learning as we move. But till then, I don't think we should just be opening up uh, everything uh, uh, all of a sudden. So, uh, can you also say something about uh, going forward? So, what should be the? I mean, this you already talked about this, uh, this closed spaces and this large crowded spaces. Other steps that uh, would be helpful in this unlockdown period? Yeah. So, uh, I think we, sh I think we should have a graded uh, response in terms of how we open up uh, closed spaces and how do we avoid uh, close contact, especially with elderly and those who are immunocompromised. So currently what's happening is uh, just in the last few days when I'm moving around uh, uh, we, in a different committee looking at the different hospitals in terms of non-COVID services, I see elderly uh, moving around without masks and ang are uh, gathering in clusters. I think this is just the beginning of uh, the unlockdown period and I feel really scared to see uh, this kind of uh, uh, momentum lost in terms of uh, whatever the success, however you would want to judge. I think we should not lose uh, the focus there. Therefore, uh, uh, enforcing use of masks in public places uh, should be the bare minimum and uh, using public transport with the same kind of precautions that are there and at least avoiding large meetings uh, in closed uh, space uh, settings uh, i think this should be the way forward thank you so maybe i, I think i think i just I, I just want to add okay. one point sure, sure. Carry on. yeah so there, it's a very practical point i think that uh, what i hear is that you know i think it's very detrimental for the uh, we all have talked about the government to um hide any data and data transparency is very critical uh, but i also think that there should be some incentives for uh, people to come out with symptoms because I talk to many people, there is no incentivization for uh, to getting tested or uh, you know people are afraid that they are going to be stigmatized as well as they are going to uh, lose wage wages and livelihoods if they get tested or they are COVID positive. So I think the psychosocial aspect of it, and also you know if you are asymptomatic or have mild uh, symptoms. Uh, if there is some incentive that for two weeks, next two weeks. So I know that in many places they did a quarantine allowance that you have a money given to you if you come forward and say that I am having symptoms and I'm going to self quarantining myself. So how to incentivize the workforce to really stay at home and they are not going to be penalized. So incentivizing testing is something that I have been thinking about quite a lot and maybe uh, the panelists have some perspective on that. I. I I think that we are getting a point uh, fact uh, wrong on that. The ICMR protocol is very clear that influenza, Rakal will stand me on this, that ILI, influenza like illness, which is symptomatic, outside hotspots and containment zones will not be tested, will not. I still hold this as a matter of shame, but it's not the people that need to be incentivized. It's the government that needs to be incentivized to allow testing. I know in my own personal experience, doctor, a number of people who have typical COVID-19 symptoms, being denied a test and helplessness being expressed by the staff, saying that we are prevented from testing you. 
and uh, the symptoms are very clear. And only when it is breathless, they did a X-ray and CT and said, "Oh, it's all right. So you're not got uh, thing." And they still didn't do the testing. So they would uh, the the reluctance to test symptomatic patients is phenomenal, and that is one of the reasons why. So the government reports that in India we have seventy percent asymptomatic cases as if it's a finding which is unique to india perhaps it is we don't know because we are not testing symptomatic cases outside hotspots severe acute respiratory infections we test but we know that is going to be only 15% of every 100 or less of every 100 persons who are infected unless we are testing and these mild and moderate people are walking around and they are the major sources likely so asymptomatic patients and Girida was say, saying this are okay there is a likely spread there may be food there will be but symptomatic definitely are and by protocol if you have to be in a hot spot so you cannot become a hot spot unless you test so there is this whole chicken and egg situation that has been built up in this and i think uh, we have a uh, we have a problem in the whole strategy because of this. I think it's a very fundamental problem in the way India goes. So for you, and you're I trying to incentivize so people with uh, with uh, uh, symptoms to get tested. Here I'm trying to get them tested somehow. Denial is very strong. Yeah, in US right now, you know, you can get tested without a doctor's order. Yeah, but we can't do that. We can do it even with the doctor's order. Okay, so uh, um, I'll get back to you. Yeah, so other questions that came were basically about uh, 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 is there a shortage of testing equipment? And uh, so, um, uh, can you share some thoughts on this? Uh, I can't say for the whole country. I mean, nobody can say for the whole country, I suppose. I do assume that there will be, for example, Jharkhand, I know, does have a shortage. Many of it tests go to Patna, etc. There are lots of areas where the testing rates are so low that there are uh, shortages. But in places like Tamil Nadu, Maharashtra, equipment shortage is not the problem. There was, in the beginning, a huge problem with reagents. That, uh, I don't know the latest update on that, but uh, it seems to be not being reported now. I don't hear many reports of that. So perhaps that is something they have tracked. We took a longer time to crack it, but track it we did. So I think that's not an issue, but I'm really worried about uh, uh, the uh, states of uh, the North and East. Dr. Sundar, do you think... Yeah, I just wanted to ask, like, you know, Hello. I have been... Uh really wondering about the investment in public health, public health education and training. And do you feel uh, this is uh, because, you know, there is a pandemic, but will this uh, investment and need to build up a trained public health workforce in biostatistics and epidemiology, in health behavior, in environmental health? Is the government really focusing on building that? Or do you think that it is OK where we, India is at uh, in terms of trained public health professionals? We have a huge gap in epidemiologists. We have 270 posts of epidemiologists, district epidemiologists posts, which are vacant, we, uh, which is part of the integrated disease surveillance program. We did the first, we meaning NHSRC, we did the first training program for organized training program with PHFI partnership for training epidemiologists. They discontinued it. The numbers trained are very, very subcritical and they are not the sort of people and the whole terms of their employment are such that they will be unwilling, they're contractual and relatively low pay and very high requirement qualification. So they are unlikely to go. They are not recruiting from the places where there is. So there is a problem. Many, uh, traditionally, I have heard many collectors, program managers, IAS officers tell me this. Okay, we want public health people, but people with good management skills. This epidemiology, epidemiology and all, we are not really looking for. So there has been a, a dismissal of epidemiology as an academic pursuit, whereas uh, public health management is all right. If you can know how to place a procurement and uh, uh, get a tender document signed or a contract signed, that's good. But this epidemiology is, you know, research. 
So now everybody is discussing RO. But you should see the first few days, everybody who was on stage, they did not even understand herd immunity. They, did, they were making wrong definitions. All the clinicians who were speaking on all the television skills were completely unembarrassed to make utter gaffes in public health because they didn't have a clue. They, they have always dismissed this as some sort of an esoteric pursuit. I love, I I love your response. I love your response. Uh, yeah. just, to ma just to mention, even while they're employed, epidemiologists still get around 400 US dollars equivalent in government positions, 300 to 400 US dollars. And temporary. Which is barely sufficient. And temporary. So maybe, yes. you know, maybe, maybe you know, this, uh, you, 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 with this platform, you have a voice uh, to really underscore the importance of this. And this may be the right moment. I, I don't want it to be like, you know, uh, this pandemic and uh, this focus, but then all is lost in building capacity and building a science, which is really critical in today's world. I, I keep saying uh, just during these times, the epidemiologists are remembered afterwards. Again, it will be back to the normal where uh, epidemiologists will be ignored. We have been crying for a really long time in terms of having I a strong... Some 30 diseases. Now, the people who are there feel their job is to collect the data and send it to Delhi. They don't really actually analyze the data, figure out their priorities and plan accordingly. Unless people start using the data, you won't going to feel the need for the epidemiologists. If their job is only as a messenger of data, somebody who is a carrier, and to a notional center who obviously can't look at minor points, no? what happens in a district is too small to be visible at a national level. It gets aggregated and lost. And But everybody's uh, uh, mindset is to send the data up. And therefore, the skills to analyze and act on data at the intermediate level are not the action points are all by vertical programs. So therefore, they don't have to think about what they will do next. As if now, Tamil mm -hmm. Maharashtra has public health cadre. Other states don't even have public health workforce. Um, yeah. By a definition, public health cadre. So therefore... It's tough. So the public health cadre, unfortunately, don't necessarily know epidemiology. That's also a problem. Because this is this management uh, push in the whole way in which we have developed that. So, in some sense, epidemiology is one paper there for their uh, training program. And that's something that you get over with. That. Uh, whereas the National Institute of Epidemiology is a good field epidemiology program. And there are some good programs that are there, but they're very small. They're too, they're too minuscule for what are India's needs. Thank you very uh, much. Uh, I was just uh, wondering I if I can jump. Yeah. Sure, carry on. No, no, ju just to jump in here, I think just to take on this thing about uh, public health uh, capacity, uh, I think it's important and I completely agree with, you know, what uh, Professor Mukherjee and Sundar have been saying. But I also want to underscore the fact that it's not just about epidemiologists and public health, uh, but it's about thinking about the larger, uh, you know, society and social justice and welfare, uh, I think, which actually then closes the circle. Uh, recently at a, at a, at a, at a conference, uh, uh, at a webinar, uh, I was trying to theorize about this quote-unquote effectiveness of, uh, you know, the Kerala model. And, and by the way, I, we, we don't use the word Kerala model. Uh, I don't think it's the right thing to do. We use the word Kerala experience now. Uh, so so we, I, we just tried, I just tried to theorize this thing about home quarantine. Okay. Now, the fact is that 83% of people in Kerala have a pakka house. 79% of people in Kerala in rural areas and 86% of people in urban areas have at least three rooms in their house. Now, I think when we talk about home quarantine and we talk about effectiveness of quarantine, we need to take these sort of things into account. 87 crores, 87 lakh food kits were uh, distributed in Kerala over the last uh, about, uh, you know, a uh, month and a half. Pensions for elderly people were distributed to them by their local banks uh, and advanced pensions were paid. Uh, there are volunteer forces 
from the local uh, you know uh, political parties and other associations that are available on call to provide a personal volunteer for every individual in their house who needs help you have a community level kitchen in serving around 1.5 lakh meals every day for those individuals who are not able to cook their own food you have the anganwadi centers providing dry rations for every child in the anganwadi so that they don't miss out their daily meal now i think when we talk about effective public health interventions if we don't talk about this whole gamut of interventions that has been built over history in kerala uh, i think we are missing i think we missed the point uh, and i and, and that is i think one of the reasons why uh, you know uh, we put out this paper uh, you know that i referred to where we said i think we are missing the point about covid when all we are talking about physical distancing uh, you know and lockdowns and and and, and this lockdown i think i i'm pretty allergic to this uh, this term because of the way it's been misused but the fact is that we need to take this much broader picture and where is the data for that where is the data on the number of people with houses where is the data with the square feet of you know uh, uh, the space available for someone to do physical distancing or to remain in lockdown or the you know uptake of uh, public uh, you know distribution system and so on so thanks no, I, I... yeah carry on from yes no i think I, this is a very important perspective and i think that in one of the articles i think i um, and the concluding statement i wrote was that the historical tenets in terms of kerala in terms of uh, the structure in, you know we have seen that pollution house quality of course again uh, rakal okay. so thank you for the perspective uh, of course it's not a data problem the data in many of these things the nsso has got very robust data which is actually quite good uh, yeah but the point is we have to actually leverage it for the analysis and understanding of many of these issues there is a problem about the way we frame the question as you have been pointing out that's very much there at some point but not do not at any point even in kerala underestimate the role that epidemiology must play you will have different problems but at some point you, in places with three rooms you will have a different set of problems in places without room but at some point you would require it and there is a problem even over there in terms of the uh, quality of epidemiology that goes on because it does you have a problem for example in the chronic illness scenario it is relatively better managed there than anywhere else in india we are not really talking about a uh, relative thing on that that of course there but at some point we do need to strengthen our uh, epidemiology understanding on that because we uh, we should have done this before the pandemic you see it will happen again so. yeah thanks to all of you i think uh, we are finally running out of time wonderful discussion and i'll just hand over to ramanujam for the concluding words Uh, but before we conclude, I want to ask uh, Dr. Girija Vedanathan if she has uh, something to add since she initiated the discussion. Uh, if she would like to. I don't see her. Okay. Yeah. I, I think I don't see her. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So we should have to stop. Yeah, I'll thank uh, thank all the panelists for this wonderful insights, and I thank all of you for all the participants here for the lively discussion. Uh, Jam, I hope you your the noise is not. Ah. Jam the fan. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thanks very much. I thank uh, all the panelists and the participants for this uh, very lively discussion, and uh, we have. recorded the discussion and we'll make it available for other people uh, we'll be continuing the symposia and uh, we have these series of webinars where isrc has been uh, ha uh, conducting debates and discussions on these issues we hope for uh, more conversations on these thank you all thanks very much thanks for this uh, lovely symposium bye bye thank you thank you everyone thank you thank you thank you everyone